I would like to call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of April 6, 2021. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Yes. Council Member Cordero? Here. Council Member Escobedo? Here. Council Member Soto? Here. Council Member Waterfield? Present. And Madam Mayor Patino? Here. Thank you very much for being here. And before we start tonight's meeting, I'd like to call for a moment of silence for the victims of the recent shootings in Boulder, Colorado, where 10 people died, Atlanta, Georgia, where eight people lost their lives and one person was injured, Washington, D.C., where an officer was killed and another seriously injured, and Orange, California, where four people lost their lives and two were seriously wounded. Our thoughts are with the families of the victims as they work through this terrible loss. We know what it's like um, in Santa Maria to have bad things happen. And uh, our condolences and our deepest feelings go out to all these communities. Madam Mayor, before we begin, yes. I have an announcement. Yes, Madam mind. Clerk. Um, I'd like to make an announcement that in order to participate in the City Council meeting virtually, please register to speak using the link on the agenda under public comment or call 1-669-900-9128 and use webinar ID number 829-7361. 0889. To raise your hand to speak on a particular agenda item, please use the raise hand button in Zoom in the Zoom meeting portal. If you're using a phone, please press star nine on your telephone keypad to raise your hand to speak. When it is your time to speak, your microphone will be unmuted for the time allotted by the mayor and will be muted upon completion of your comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The first item this evening is a proclamation and Council Member Soto will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, today's proclamation is in honor of National Library Week. Whereas the theme of National Library Week, Welcome to Your Library, was selected as a result of the remarkable adjustments public libraries made to reimagine service during the pandemic. And whereas the City of Santa Maria Public Library is open for business during the current pandemic, offering sidewalk service, take home program kits, grab and go service at branch locations, and phone and email service to the community. And whereas the City of Santa Maria Public Library's virtual library is open online 24 seven and provides a rich variety of services for children, teens and adults and access to eBooks, movies, music, games, virtual story times, interactive Zoom activities, and more from the comfort of home. And whereas the City of Santa Maria Public Library launched its bookmobile during the pandemic, bringing safe and accessible library services outside the physical building. And whereas when the community eventually returns to normal, the City of Santa Maria Public Library is ready to expand services and continue to meet the needs of the community through enhanced collections, thoughtful programs, and outreach services. And whereas librarians are trained professionals and help people of all ages and backgrounds find and interpret the information they need to live, learn, and work, especially during difficult times. Now, therefore, the mayor, Alice Patino of the city of Santa Maria hereby recognizes April 4th through the 10th, 2021 as National Library Week in the city of Santa Maria and encourages all residents to find their place at the library by visiting the library online, use it, utilizing the sidewalk and grab and go services and engaging in virtual programming as a means to explore the many services available during this unprecedented time. Thank you, Ms. Soto. You know, when are we, when is the library gonna be opened? It's open, it's open but. Yeah, so the library, um, sorry, Madam Mayor, members of the council. So we're, uh, the library was able to open uh, this week. They uh, started opening at the end of last week and we've been uh, back up and running this week. We do have germ guards mitigation, some 
Um, people, there aren't seats, uh, so people can come in and get the what they want and and uh, pick up their items and check out the library, but or have a 20 minute limit and aren't able to stay there at this point until we get back into the orange tier. But it is open and, and running. Okay, it is open, yep. but not as, as it was pre-COVID, no. and so it's a 20 minute period. Right. Okay, Thanks. got it. Thank you. The, our next order of business is a proclamation and council member Escobedo will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Proclamation for Community Development Week. City of Santa Maria. Where is uh, the week of April 5 to 9, 2021 has been designed as National Community Development Week to recognize and celebrate the Community Development Block Grant Program and the Home Investment Partnership Home Program. And whereas since 1974, the CDGB program has provided annual funding and flexibility to local communities to provide affordable housing and suitable living environment and basic human services. And whereas since 1990, the home program has created and preserved affordable housing for low-income families, and whereas the CDBG attracts invest, investment in underserved communities. Every dollar of CDBG funding leverage another $4.09, and whereas home attracts investment in underserved communities. Every $1 of home funding leverage another 4.52 cents of dollar. And whereas over the past five years, the city of Santa Maria has invested more than 7.5 million in CDBG funds and more than 1 million in home funds into the community. Now, therefore, uh, Alice Patino, mayor of Santa Maria, do hereby designate the week of April 5th to 9th 2021 as National Community Development Week in the city of Santa Maria to celebrate, to celebrate and showcase the programs and projects which are funded by federal grant programs like Community Development Block Grants and Home Investment Partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Escobedo. Next, we have another proclamation. I will be making the presentation and this is for Fair Housing Month. Whereas the city of Santa Maria recognizes that the United States Congress enacted Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which was amended by the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 and the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988 as the directive for fair housing. And whereas fair housing laws outlined by said acts guarantee the rights of equal housing opportunities for all residents of the United States, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. And whereas the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development declares the month of April 2021 as Fair Housing Month. And whereas the city of San Maria contracts with the Legal Aid Foundation of the Santa Barbara County to perform random testing of fair housing practices of landlords and property managers, reviews local newspapers for evidence of housing discrimination, assist in resolving discrimination disputes through litigation or referrals, makes presentations to Santa Maria adult education classes regarding rights of single parents and ethnic minorities to equal housing opportunities, and conducts community workshops to educate landlords and property managers regarding fair housing. Now, therefore, I, Alice M. Patino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria, do hereby recognize the month of April 2021 as Fair Housing Month in the city of Santa Maria and encourage and con the continued celebration of equal housing opportunities and the progress made in opening the doors to housing opportunities for all residents of Santa Maria. Witness thereof, I appear to set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Santa Maria to be affixed here to the 6th day of April, 2021. And this will be mailed to the Legal Aid Foundation, which does such a great job in our city in helping housing and any time that we have housing discrimination. So um, 
Ms. Rojo, did you wish to say a few words to comment on the Development and Fair Housing Proclamation? Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, thank you so much on behalf of Legal Aid Foundation. Uh, Legal Aid continues to work hard to make sure fair housing is implemented and sustained in the community. And also, thank you so much for CD Week proclamation. I left a copy of our CD Week newsletter on your desk. Uh, I've also mailed it out. We mailed it out to over 500 uh, people, and it's also going to be posted on our um, special projects website. Great. But it showcases just some of the many um, agencies that have received CDBG and home funding and all the wonderful things they're doing in our community, thanks to the allocations you provide every year. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Rowe. Our next, the next council member, Waterfield, will present the next proclamation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This proclamation has to deal with child abuse um, in our community and in their, our surrounding area. Whereas child abuse and neglect are a community condition and problem, and finding solutions depend on involvement among people in the community. And whereas the effects of child abuse and neglect are felt by communities and need to be addressed by the entire community. And whereas North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center and its CAPC partners have been committed to educating this community on child abuse and neglect and are sponsoring several events throughout the month to heighten public awareness of abuse in the Northern County of Santa Barbara. These events will provide information and materials that support families to prevent child maltreatment and celebrate people who work with, the, who work with and support children and families. And whereas effective child abuse prevention programs succeed because of partnerships created among social service agencies, schools, youth organizations, religious organizations, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community and residents. And whereas all residents should become more aware of the importance of prevention in the community and become involved in supporting parents to raise their children in a safe, nurturing environment. Now therefore, Alice M. Patino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria, do hereby recognize April 2021 as National Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month in the City of Santa Maria and call upon all residents, community agencies, religious organizations, businesses and medical facilities to increase their participation in the effort to prevent child abuse. And Madam Mayor, this uh, proclamation will be mailed to the North County Rape Crisis and Child Abuse Protection Center. Thank you. And I see we have the proclamation, and you are going to be making the next presentation on yes. National Sexual Assault Prevention Awareness. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And uh, both of these proclamations go hand in hand together. And it's just been at such a heightened degree with COVID and families being locked in. I think it's just so important that we, you know, take that extra step in concern in regards to this. Whereas National Sexual Assault Awareness Month is an annual campaign to raise public awareness about sexual assault and educate communities and individuals on how to prevent sexual violence. And whereas people of all racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds fall victim to sexual violence, which is widespread and impacts every person in the community. And whereas rape and sexual violence of all kinds continue to occur at an alarming rate, with California having the most reported rapes in the United States, and with the Department of Justice stating that an American is sexually assaulted every 98 seconds in the United States. And whereas emotional and physical scars resulting from sexual violence are often permanent, Therefore, working together to educate the community about sexual violence prevent prevention, supporting survivors, and speaking out against harmful attitudes and actions is so important. And whereas a coalition of organizations exists which directly confronts this crisis, including North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center, law enforcement agencies, churches, health care providers, and volunteers from the, from the community that serve these agencies who are helping in the efforts to end sexual assault. And whereas prevention is possible when everyone gets involved gets involved in increasing education, awareness, and community involvement, recognizing the compassion and dedication of the indi individuals involved in this effort, and noting the challenges of the victims, survivors of sexual assaults, 
sexual assault and their families and friends as they struggle to cope with the, rea with the reality of sexual violence. Now therefore, Alice M. Pentino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria, do hereby recognize April 2021 as National Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month in the City of Santa Maria and encourage all residents and businesses to, to, to participate in a month full of recognition and activities promoted by North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center to increase <coughs> awareness of sexual assault and to create solutions in an effort to eliminate the sexual violence from the city of Santa Maria. And this proclamation will also be mailed to the North County Rape Crisis Center. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Ms. Waterfield. And Allison Wales is on. Okay. And she represents the North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection oh, Center. And she is registered to comment on the proclamation. Ms. Wales, did you want to say a few words? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Mayor Pertino and um, Councilman uh, Cordero. Uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize you for attending yesterday at our pinwheel event in Santa Maria. Um, it was a, a wonderfully attended event, and in fact, all of our pinwheels for child abuse awareness um, with our CAPC partners, Child Abuse Prevention Council, um, was so well attended. Um, after last year, when we couldn't do any, we were so excited to have people attend. And um, we planted almost a thousand pinwheels across the North County from Solving to Guadalupe. Um, pinwheels are, represent one in five children that the CWS has actually um, have enough evidence to have an investigation upon. And the reality of it is, is that child abuse is still very hidden in our community. And even though the pinwheels are up for a short time, it helps us remember that they are there and there are nonprofits and government agencies working and striving every day to advocate and counsel um, these young victims to help um, change their lives. Um, and even though we pick them up in a few weeks, uh, we will continue that fight. Also, I'd like to take a few words to say thank you for the Sexual Assault Awareness Month uh, proclamation as well. We are still very virtual um, as far as a lot of our outreach. I encourage everyone on the council and those who are listening to tune into our Facebook and social media accounts. There's a lot of videos and um, art displays and things that would, even our, our candlelight vigil will be held virtual this year. Um, However, I would like to say that we have not stopped in our advocacy, our counseling, and our outreach, even to our schools um, uh, throughout the entire year. But we are anxious and ready um, for the summer to be here, so we are more more face to face. Um, and I also want to take this chance real quick to say thank you to the um, CDBG Advisory Committee for their recommendations for the 2021 20, 22 uh, funding year for the entire council for recognizing um, those recommendations. We appreciate all of you so much, and I can't wait to be there and see you in person uh, soon. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wales. Now we have another proclamation, and Councilmember Cordero will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Before I make this presentation, I just want to mention the last two presentations that uh, Councilwoman Waterfield read are particularly um, important to me. I was on the uh, rape crisis board for about, for, for well over 25 years, 26 years I think, and my wife took my place when I was elected to the council in 2008. And so we were associated with the North County rape crisis for well over 30 years, and I watched them grow from basically a garage to where they now own their own building over there in, in Lompoc and have a satellite office here in Santa Maria. Uh, it, it, they do a tremendous job. Uh, it was a, a big part of that part of my career in, uh, in working with them and, and uh, being involved with writing the policy on how we were going to modernize at the Santa Maria Police Department and, and work with sexual assault victims. And uh, they certainly deserve everything that they're getting. I just want to mention that it's much more important than just a reading of a piece of paper, and uh, I think Ms. Waterfield uh, and yourself and this young Wales, is it? She, she they yes. all gave that, that very example. Um, my uh, proclamation here is uh, dealing with the, uh, I forgot here, Donation of Life Month. Uh, <clears throat> whereas uh, organ tissue, marrow, and blood donation are life-giving acts recognized worldwide as expressions of compassion 
to those in need, more than 100, 108,000 individuals nationwide and more than 21,000 in California are currently on the national organ transplant uh, waiting list. And on the average, 17 people die each day while waiting <clears throat> due to a uh, shortage of donated organs. And whereas the need for donated organs is especially urgent in Hispanic, Latino, and African American communities, and whereas a single individual's donation of a heart, lung, liver, kidneys, pancreas, pancreas and small intestine can save up to eight lives. Donation of tissue can save and heal. The, uh, the pancreas and a small intestine can, can uh, save up to eight more lives. And donation tissue can save and heal the lives of more than 75 others. And a single blood donation can help three people in need. And whereas millions of lives each year are saved and healed by donors of organ, tissues, marrow, blood, and the spirit of giving and the decision to donate are not restricted by age, medical condition, and California residents interested in saving the lives through the giving a living of kidneys and donations are encouraged to visit uh, the World Wide Web, livingdonationcalifornia.org for more information. And whereas the Santa Maria residents can sign up with the and donate Life, Cal Life California registry when applying for a, and renewing their driver's license or ID card at the Department of Motor Vehicles. There's a little yellow or a little pink dot that they put on your driver's license. Now, therefore, Alice Patino, mayor of the city of Santa Maria, recognizes April 21 as National uh, Donate Life Month in the city of Santa Maria and encourages everyone to check yes when applying for the renewal of their driver's license or ID card or by signing up at the DonateLifeCalifornia.org or DonateVitaCalifornia.org. Signed by our mayor, Alice Patino. And this will be mailed to Scott Burns with the Donate Life Registry. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And I, I was just checking to make sure on my, and I noticed uh, Ms. Soto was also checking to make sure that we had that little pink dot on yes. our driver's license. So it was just to remind everyone you can do that. And I guess Mr. Burns is registered to speak. Mr. Burns, are you there? Yes, I, I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, as I you said, my name is Scott Burns. Memorial Day weekend, 2015, I'm at a friend's sailboat, Santa Cruz Island, and the Santa Barbara Harbor Patrol comes up behind me and says, Mr. Burns, we have a kidney for you. They didn't realize, or, well, most people didn't realize I had kidney failure. I got on their boat, came back to Santa Barbara, and drove down to Cedar sinai The following morning at 11.30 in the morning, I had a fully functioning kidney. As, as Council Member Cordero mentioned, about 107 people were nationwide or on the kidney list and the organ do donation list, which is about the size of the city of Santa Maria. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of people. But my donation is only part of the story. Vivian Boutel, a nurse at Cottage Hospital, died suddenly and she died in a way that her organs could be donated. I never got to meet Vivian, but I got to meet her, her mom, her sisters, her nieces and nephews, and now I volunteer with them at Organ Donation Month and uh, the Rose Bowl Float. So I do appreciate all the help that the city of Santa Maria gives in promoting organ donations. Yes, the pink dot is an important thing. We all need to have one on our driver's license. The issue that we always seem to have is while 90% of the people in California feel they need to uh, they promote organ donations, only 43% are on the waiting list, uh, have a pink dot. So we need to, to work on that. And one other thing with the pandemic, we found that if you actually recover from COVID-19, you are still able to donate your organs and we always need people that would donate their organs. I thank you very much for your support of Organ Donation Month, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. 
The next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Madam Clerk, could you please read the criteria for public comment portion of the agenda? Uh, this time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda this evening. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. However, state law does not allow action to be taken on matters not on the printed agenda. As a reminder, if you wish to speak during public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand button in Zoom. Or if you are participating by phone, please press star nine on your telephone keypad. When it is your time to speak, your microphone will be unmuted for the time allotted by the mayor and will be muted upon completion of your comments. Thank you. Do we have any written comments or requests to speak this evening? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor uh, and members of the City Council. Staff has received 16 written communications and uh, a signature petition containing 563 signatures objecting to con uh, consent calendar item 3C, the second reading of the ordinance regulating mobile car washes. Each generally communicated the ordinance would be too much of a financial burden on mobile car wash owners and put many people out of work. These communications were emailed to the city council and have been posted on the website agenda for tonight's meeting for public viewing. We received an, an anonymous written comment um, in support of the ordinance as well as a phone call in support of the ordinance. And Madam Mayor, it looks like we have a number of hands raised in, um, in our Zoom meeting. Um, but okay, okay, thank you. Um, I understand we have a request for an interpreter for this item. So, so why don't we take the, Ms. Rojo is going to assist in the interpretation for public comment. So if we can accept that individual for the public comment first. Okay. And I believe um, Ms. Rojo has an announcement before um, okay. I um, let the gentleman on. Okay, Ms. Rojo? The, the announcement will be that if they choose to, for, for me to translate, that I ask that they stop every five to 10 seconds so I can translate what they've said so far. That way I can ensure that I am capturing everything they want to say. Uh, señor, si gusta que yo traduzca su comentario, por favor, pare cada 5 a 10 segundos para que pueda traducir lo que ha dicho. Así puedo yo captar lo que está tratando de decirle al concilio. Gracias. Thank you. Madam Mayor, the individual who requested an interpreter was Renee Asoba. I have asked to unmute. Okay, so we use three minutes, but when we have the interpreter, let's, we'll make it six minutes. René, uh, ¿puede oprimir el botón que dice unmute? There we go. Gracias. was translated for me. That's great. <laughs> sure, no problem. If you, uh, Ms. Rowe, I'll you, be here. Why don't you ask if there's anyone that needs an interpreter or tra sure. translator? Hay alguien que gusta decir algo en español que puedo traducir antes de que sigan con los comentarios en inglés? Si, si hay alguien que guste 
decir algo en español, por favor, uh, suba la mano virtualmente en la pantalla de Zoom. Um, they don't have any way to respond unless I unmute them, so okay. um, we won't know until we reach our next speaker. But I did know of uh, Mr. Silva who requested an interpreter. So. Okay. So then we'll go on, to, and if there's someone that requests an interpreter, then, sure. okay. Thank you so much, yeah, Ms. No Rojo. problem. And Madam Mayor, I apologize. I had this great little timer up here working earlier, uh -huh. and now it is not. So I will be back to our traditional timer, timer. down here. Okay. So I apologize about that. Well, we'll make it work. Thank um, you. We have uh, Miguel uh, Delgado who has their hand up. Okay. Mr. Delgado, are you available to speak? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, uh, we will move on. Uh, we have uh, John, oh, oh, here he comes. Mr. Delgado? Do you, do you want to start? Yes. Thank you for letting me speak. On behalf of my colleagues, I am against the Ordinance 421. With all due respect, I'd like you to think that all we want to do is work. We want to work for our families and our kids and show them a good example. These other, these, this ordinance will leave us no choice but to seek assistance from the government. We are just getting out of the pandemic and what the city council wants to do is like a bomb for us. Yo creo que deberían, deberían de enfocarse en otros puntos más importantes como el crimen, el robo, las drogas y, y en esto que nosotros estamos trabajando, eh, no le estamos haciendo daño a nadie. Estamos, I think es you should focus y... on crime and robbery and what we're doing right now is not doing anybody any harm. Otra, quiero preguntarle... Alguien me puede decir los las eh, empresas, eh, los rancheros que tienen dónde tiran los contaminantes, los pesticidas, los químicos, los ácidos. ¿Dónde? Can, can someone can someone tell me where the ranchers and farmers throw away their contamination? Uh, por último, pues yo estoy muy afectado por esto, la verdad, me eh, llevo noches sin dormir, eh, estoy, eh, me ha afectado mucho en mi salud, Ultimate. yo creo que esto es una, pues están violando nuestros derechos como personas, como seres humanos. This has affected me greatly, I can't sleep, uh, and I haven't been able to eat, and this is just really affecting us greatly. Uh, muchas gracias, es todo por el momento. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Um, we have another hand up by uh, Mr. John McKinnon. Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Good. Oh, good evening. My name is John McKinnon, and I'm a Santa Maria Valley resident and attorney with the County of Santa Barbara. 
and I'm also a driver of a 2020 electric Honda Kona. I wanted to speak on the proposed Tesla supercharger agreement before the council, as well as on the need for growth of public electric vehicle charging stations uh, in the city of Santa Maria. According to the Department of Energy, 80% of electric vehicles are charged at home. However, EV owners who live in apartments or multi-unit dwellings need an affordable public charger for their vehicle. The proposed 12 level two chargers with free electricity will certainly help. However, the need for public EV charging stations continues to grow, and unfortunately, Santa Maria is behind the curve at this point compared to other local cities. Electrify America just erected fencing near the Target store for future installation of the first modern DC fast charger, commonly called the level three charger, in the city. Meanwhile, San Luis Obispo, Paso Robles, Pismo Beach, Buellton, and Solvang already have DC FCs installed. These chargers allow an EV to charge from 0 to 80% in just 30 to 60 minutes. I'm sure the city is aware of the upcoming funding from the state Cal EVIP program, which is anticipated to start this July. Several million dollars for Santa Barbara County will be available for businesses, government, and nonprofits to install EV chargers for public use. Public locations within the city could also include the city library parking structure, a lawn bowling area, an EV station could be placed in the police department public parking lot on West Bedaravia, thus providing a safe charging location for residents in that area of the city. Kilowatt fees can be set in order to cover the cost of electricity and maintenance. City employees could be given a discount or a set amount of free charging as a work incentive. This is similar to the chargers that are available to teachers at Allen Hancock College. Two pillars, each with two connectors, could be entitled up to about $20,000 in funding. I would strongly encourage the city to begin looking at the Cal EIP program as funding will be first come, first served. Finally, the city is in need of direct current chargers or level three chargers. Tesla supercharger can be used by Tesla, it cannot be used by any other EV manufacturers such as Chevy, Ford, GMC, Toyota, Honda, or others. As I mentioned before, if ECFC can charge an electric vehicle, from 0 to 80 percent in about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the vehicle or kilowatt. The Highway 101 exits of Better Angus Toll and Main Street are ideal locations for deep FCs for both residents and highway traveler use. Again, I would encourage the city to look at the Cal EVIP funding and now look at potential locations to the city can to apply for funds when applications can be turned in. Again, this funding is first come, first served from those cities in the county that wait maybe left with nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Um, next speaker we have is uh, Mr. David Bixby. Thank you. Uh, I'm here tonight to uh, represent the, the uh, advisory board for the Salvation Army. And what I'd like to do is just congratulate all of our uh, partners in caring for people. We've done a lot during this uh, COVID season. Uh -huh. Our particular organization is reaching out to about three to 400 people every week um, with the, uh, perhaps the, uh, the poorest residents of Santa Maria being served by the Salvation Army. Uh, some of the things that we are doing presently include reaching out to families that actually have been impacted by COVID-19 and uh, servicing their, their needs. Uh, we uh, attempt to reach people uh, to help them with partial housing when they need housing assistance. And uh, as a result of all this, uh, you know, we, we are in need of help, but, but because of a transition that occurred uh, earlier last year, we were unable to make a, a, a grant application. However, we support all the other people in the community that have been providing services to uh, the community as, as we do. And we want you to know that uh, we will continue to do that. One of the organizations that has been such a benefit to us in being able to provide food uh, is, of course, the uh, County Food Bank. We really appreciate the, uh, the help and assistance that we receive from them in order to uh, be able to provide uh, for uh, the members of the community that we serve. 
And I want to thank the city council. I want to thank the city uh, police department for all the help that we have received over the last year in making uh, our environment as safe and as uh, supported as possible by the city of Santa Maria. And we just say thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Our next speaker we have on the list is Robin Palms Palmerston. Robin Palmerston, will you unmute? There you go. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and council members. My name is Robin Palmerston. I'm the director of the Children's House Montessori School, which has been a, a proud member of the Santa Maria Valley community for the past 39 years, serving children ages two to 12. The COVID-19 pandemic spotlighted the critical need for early care and education professionals and their programs to serve our community. Those professionals who were able to either remain open or were able to reopen during the pandemic did so with elevated safety protocols, heightened regulations and increased costs, and often at risk to themselves and their own families. Nonetheless, these essential workers, the early care and education professionals, have provided safe spaces for children, learning opportunities, and needed social and emotional support. The interconnectedness of early care and education with our city's businesses, the city's operations, families, and schools is being brought into greater focus. In 1971, the National Association for the Education of Young Children established April as a time to celebrate and recognize the critical role of early care and education professionals and quality programs. So this is the 50th anniversary of Month of the Young Child. It's fitting to recognize and celebrate early care and education professionals in our city their dedication to children and their families, and to recognize how essential they are to the vitality of our city. Perhaps the council would consider making a public statement to that effect during this month. Now is a time to commit how we, as citizens of a community, will better meet the needs of all young children and their families, and to honor the often overlooked early care and education professionals who meet the needs of our city's youngest citizens. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, next, uh, the next speaker I show on our list, um, Alexa Martin, I believe wants to speak on um, the CDBG item. Can you just confirm that? And if so, uh, we'll call on you uh, when that item is up. Yes, that was actually, I was going to ask that question. Okay. I, um, I will wait until we're at item four. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the next speaker I show here is Chris Barajas. Chris, there you go. Chris, go ahead and unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Good evening, Good evening. Good evening. My name is Chris Barajas. These are trying times amid a once in a century pandemic. We have dealt with all kinds of shortages. We have seen ourselves. We have had to social distance. We have seen colleges and schools shut down. We have seen prisons and jails release inmates early to avoid spreading illness. We have seen business after business close, many temporarily and some permanently. Unemployment remains high for the, un for the foreseeable future and colleges have seen a significant drop in enrollment. The future looks bleak for our young adults just beginning their adult lives. I'm here to speak on behalf of the many, many hardworking men and women who exemplify the true entrepreneurial spirit, seeking a better change and to lift themselves out of poverty or to improve their financial situation that can no longer 
provide for the basic necessities of human sustainment. These innovative small business owners have found an inexpensive opportunity that can really make a difference towards that goal for them and their families by improving on and providing the service that is essential now more than ever when you consider the residents who are at greater risk of severe illness with COVID-19 and would gain from a mobile detail service that can actually sanitize and limit exposure to the vehicle. Mobile wash and detailing is that business and these dreamers are Santa Maria residents. Some were born and raised here. Some are trying to assimilate in a country that doesn't want them except to do menial labor. It shouldn't matter that some are immigrants from another country or that some don't speak English. They make up the fabric of Santa Maria and provide essential labor and services to this community. And if they want to use their brains or their backs to better themselves, then they should be allowed to do so. Let's embrace that quality, not stomp it out. I want to let the council and the public to know that the true number of part-time and full-time mobile wash and detailers is 180, with half of those using at least one helper for a total of 270 families involved in the service and I know each and every one of them personally. Not the 80 that the city manager believes based on the number of business licenses issued. And that, based on the 2010 census, each San Maria household consists of 3.77 family members. For a total of 1,018 Santa Maria residents that depend wholly or in part on this income. This work provides millions of dollars annually. Money that is spread out among many, many families. Money that is spent in this valley of ours. It provides home and rent money, car purchases for local dealers equipment from local suppliers, food from local grocery stores, clothes from local department stores, dinners from local restaurants, and so much more. The best thing about it is that none of this money comes from the city or any other type of government program. On the contrary, all this merchandise is taxed and that actually puts money into the city coffers. It also provides an outlet for the young children of these business owners. Instead of wasting the day away staring at their phones, playing video games, or doing worse things in the streets, they are actually learning life skills positive work ethics and reaping the rewards of their labor and lessening the reliance on their parents for their own personal wants and needs. I put my two sons to work beginning at age 12 and the oldest went into the army for eight years, did two tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. He now has gainful employment, yet he still details on the side because he learned a trade that he is good at and enjoys. My other son is attending Thank, hands thank you, Mr. Barajas. Uh, your three minutes are up at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker um, is, uh, looks like Mr. Brian Hollander, but I believe he's registered to speak also on a, um, a CDBG item, but if you are wanting to speak during this item as well. Mr. Hollander. Okay, I'll move on. The next um, speaker, Kent Bullard. Mr. Bullard? Um, you wish to speak during public comment? Say again? You wish to speak during public comment? Yes, please. Okay, go ahead. Madam Mayor and City Council members, my name is Kent Bullard. I'm a resident of Ventura. I'm speaking tonight in my role as the transportation chair of the Los Padres chapter of the Sierra Club. Santa Barbara County is making great strides toward the adoption of electric vehicles by both the public and municipal entities. Santa Maria is positioned in North County in Assembly Bill Area 1550, Senate Bill 535, designated low income and disadvantaged zones. There are only a few opportunities for residents and travelers to charge electric vehicles within the city. It is excellent that Electrify America has broken ground to build an EV charger near the target on Breda Vera. And now there is the further opportunity to install a Tesla supercharger at town center. This installation has many benefits to include bringing travelers to town center to provide residents with 12 free to use public level two chargers and further to pay annual rent to the city. My only two requests are that the lease arrangement is approved and that the city post and enforce California vehicle code 22511 to prevent blocking of the charging facilities by vehicles not actively charging. Thank you and I appreciate all the work you're doing to make this happen. It's a great thing. Good night. 
Thank you for your comments. The next um, speaker in line is Sean Kelly Thorne. However, I also think you've registered for um, a CDBG item. Did you wish to speak on public comment? Sean Kelly Thorne. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand then if you um, don't wish to speak on public comment and you are going to speak on uh, the CDPG item, you would raise your hand later. Right, okay, I'll do that. This is new for me. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Okay, I think we have three uh, remaining speakers. Uh, Manuel Estrada. You heard me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Manuel Estrada, and my company is Estrada Auto Detailing. Been since 2010. My equipment includes uh, 500 gallons for tank because I wash our commercial trucks, and I use about 100 gallons for per truck. He made he made me work easier and save me time to going to buy a processed water. And I have accounts with national companies. They came and leave the money here in San Maria. That helps the local economy. We are essential workers because we wash the inside of the trailers so they, they can load food. For example, coolers are some local companies that require my service to do the wash up because they love foods. One of my customers loves food items for the USDA, which is part of the government. Food for schools and those trailers and containers are inspected by USDA inspector. If the trailer doesn't pass the trial inspection, they require my service to wash it. Wash it up and sanitize the trailer when they inspect the trailer again to be able to load it. If my company doesn't complete with the new regulations that the city wants to impose the money that companies bring to San Maria, we have to go to Salinas or Los Angeles, which is the closest truck wash. We're taking about local and national companies. As you know, Santa Maria is a surrounding our agricultural area where national and the International products are distributed. A mobile car wash is not only based in washing cars, it's also based in washing commercial trucks and containers that are being shipped on train or boat. I understand that you are concerned by soap and water entering the sewers, but there are, uh, are many of us who are following the regulations on the Santa Maria Car Wash Mobile Guide brochure. We collect the water and disposal in green areas. The new proposition wants to provide us from working on the public streets of Santa Maria. We are putting our cones and measurements. Also, we are paying our taxes on the city of Santa Maria or business license. And thank you for listening to me. And we hope you understand that we are worried and we are going out of our business and can, can provide our families in the middle of this pandemic where millions of the people were out of the job. That's it. Thank you. Um, the next speaker we have, then followed by our final, it will be Miguel, followed by Mark Holtman, and that will be our last speaker after. Miguel, are you available to speak now? Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, okay. ¿Sí me escucha? Sí, sí lo escuchamos. Uh, mi nombre es Miguel Ángel Peña. My name is Miguel Ángel. Uh, uh, queridos uh, miembros del consul, uh, yo soy uh, dueño de un car wash. Dear City Council, I am an owner of a car wash. The only thing we're asking para, is that you let us work. Para, uh, 
así enseñarles, por ejemplo, yo tengo cinco hijos, entonces uno de ellos es el que me ayuda a hacer el trabajo, entonces yo les estoy enseñando honestidad, trabajar honradamente y más que nada mantenerlo fuera de las calles. I have five children and all that we ask is that you let us show our five kids, especially one that works with me, uh, that how to do honest hard work. Uh, nosotros, yo, especialmente yo y mis colegas, no tenemos nada con ustedes. Este, nomás pedimos que pues las regulaciones que ustedes nos quieren poner sean un poco menos estrictas. Me and my colleagues don't have anything against the city council. We just ask that your rules aren't as strict. Y pues eh, espero que lleguemos a un punto medio en que podamos nosotros también cumplir las regulaciones que ustedes nos puedan poner algo, eh, poner una, en una balanza todo para que sea algo, no un punto medio. And I hope we can come to a common ground so that we can also abide by the rules and I hope that we can both just come to an agreement. Porque con, con eso de la, de la pandemia, pues si nos, yo perdí mi trabajo y pues me tuve que dedicar a, a hacer a car wash. Entonces, de ahí estoy proveyendo para toda mi familia y para todas mis necesidades que, que poco. I lost my job because of the pandemic, and so I started doing the mobile car wash, and this is what I use to generate income. It's what I depend on. Eso es eh, todo de mi parte, y espero que eh, sea algo, una respuesta positiva de parte de ustedes. Buenas tardes. That's all. I hope a positive response from you. Good afternoon. Final speaker under public comment is uh, Mark Coltman. Are you available? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you, uh, council members. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Mark Coltman. He is my husband. Um, he has been detailing since 1994. He owns MK uh, Auto Detailing. I've always been careful with the chemicals I use while detailing. Detailing is how I support my family. If this ordinance passes, with all the fees and fines that are being proposed, I will not be able to continue detailing, which is what I love doing. Because I set my own hours, I am able to be there for my family. I am a mobile detailer. I have never, nor will I ever, become stationary. I do believe we could use some guidelines to follow, but not what has been proposed. We provide a service that big car washes do not provide. We come to you, we clean and sanitize the inside of your vehicle. Please let us help come up with something that will be beneficial to all parties involved. This ordinance, as it is written, will prohibit, prohibitively challenge anyone wanting to enter into this business and will eliminate the 90 helpers and the 90 part-timers and half of the full-timers in the first week of enforcement. The 45 or so that are left will thin out in the first year due to violations and permit suspensions by process of elimination. Many will just quit and be forced to find full-time work elsewhere. I predict that 230 families will lose this priced income. I also think that these families will struggle to find a way to replace that income. I hope that the city will be ready and willing to help them with evictions, utilities, payments, job placement, food donations, etc. And with serious crimes up in Santa Barbara County, 18% from 2019. Is the city really going to risk adding to those figures? Now is not the time to prohibit, limit, restrict, and deprive these workers of their freedom and pursuit of financial stability. I urge the council members to take all of this into consideration before casting your vote on such an important topic that will have long-lasting consequences for many of your residents. I want the council to know that we are conscious of the extent of our concerns and that we are willing to work with the city manager to revise the current ordinance. I feel that we can address the city's, the city's environmental concerns as well as convert the few mobile washers that choose to be stationary to once again be mobile. As a goodwill gesture, we have agreed to stop working on Boone Street to show our willingness to compromise. We do not dispute that mobile means mobile, and by working together, we can come up with a reasonable method of enforcement that ensures that all streets in San Maria are free of stationary washers. 
I have said that some regulation is okay, just don't over-regulate us out of our business. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you for your comments. Um, that's it? Okay, that's fine. Sure. Okay, so our final um, public comment speaker will be Jaime Garduno. Um, well, was... ¿Me escuchan? Just, yes. Sí, 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 Yo, yo soy, este, yo agarro un part-time pa del car wash, tengo un trabajo en otro lado. I do, I, I do mobile car wash part-time, I have a, I have another job. Porque ahorita con la pandemia, pues la verdad no, nos recortaron las horas y no, no, no alcanza el dinero. Tenemos que ayudar a, a nuestros padres. Right now. Para, okay. Oh, sorry. Right now with the pandemic, uh, we had to get, we got our hours reduced and we had to get another job. We have to help our parents. Entonces, uh, yo lo que quiero pues es que nos dejen, que nos dejen trabajar. Yo sé que hay regulaciones que quieren meter. What I would like is for you to let us work. I know that you have to implement recommendation, uh, regulations. Pero, pues, estamos dispuestos a acatarlas las regulaciones que ustedes quieran, pero que sea algo justo, porque de este trabajo dependen pues nuestras familias, nuestros hijos. We we don't mind following the rules, they just have to be just because we depend on this for our families. Entonces, aparte de eso, pues nosotros le enseñamos a nuestros hijos cómo se trabaja, cómo se vive en este país haciendo cosas uh, bien sin sin robar. Sin hacer cosas mal. We're also trying to show our kids how to earn a living and without doing anything wrong, without doing anything illegal. Entonces, yo lo que les pido, los señores cónsules, que y a todo, a todas las autoridades que nos dejen trabajar, um, porque contribuimos también para la ciudad y para todo. I'm asking the city council to let us work. We contribute to the city. Sería todo de mi parte y les agradezco por escucharnos. This is all and thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you. Um, before we move on, Mr. Stillwell, did you wish to make any comments? Do you wish to make any comments? Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. So uh, regarding the Tesla charging station, a couple comments made by comment by the public commenters were um, assuring that the spaces aren't blocked and that we actually enforce the penal or the um, traffic code to, uh, related to that. And um, we do have that in the, uh, in the agreement for council's consideration does include a clause that uh, if Tesla notifies us that the spaces are blocked that we'll uh, enforce that. In addition, it is a public area and our rangers do patrol it on a regular basis as public property and they'll be looking out for that issue as well. Uh, regarding the mobile car wash comments, I'd ask um, City Attorney Tom Watson to respond. Mr. Watson? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I absolutely agree with many of the comments. We want our local entrepreneurs to work. We are very supportive of our small business people, and we recognize that while the state is pushing us in a direction both for drought and water purposes and also for wastewater purposes, which makes such regulation necessary, that we will be very fair and consistent in attempting to keep the businesses intact and working. The, the unfortunate part is a great deal of misinformation that has been provided uh, to our local community and particularly to our car washing vendors. Um, the city uh, code enforcement division has no intention of running anyone out of business. As a matter of fact, we wanna encourage uh, more businesses, but we wanna encourage smart businesses. So by way of a, what we call a soft rollout, the code enforcement supervisor, as well as one of our Spanish speaking officers, we will uh, arrange a workshop to meet with the car washers to get them to understand what's in the ordinance 
and so that they can comply. Because what we want is compliance and not in enforcement and citations. That has never been the Santa Maria way. It hasn't been the way through COVID and it hasn't been the way under my administration. I will continue that. A couple of specific items I wanted to make mention of is that um, we will be endeavoring to see those portions of the ordinance that are difficult for small business people to manage and we will be bringing back in the fall a uh, modifications as necessary. Secondly, we are proposing no fees at this time uh, because we don't want to financially impact these folks. What we want to do is get them licensed and under compliance so we have a, a good handle. Clearly, uh, Mr. Barajas knows of more unlicensed and, and people who don't have business licenses. We want everyone to be in compliance. Thirdly, as uh, the, the individual, uh, uh, Ms. P Ms. Um, uh, Holtman stated, we want people to be mobile. One of our difficulties has been the neighborhood complaints of stationary, long, long uh, lines, loud music, and lots of, of material in the, in the drains and gutters. Those are what we are going to be specifically looking at and trying to reduce, because we want to reduce the neighborhood congestion and the neighborhood issues. What we are going to try and figure out is how to work best for us as, as regulators and work best for the small business people to make a good livelihood. That's our, that that is, is my pledge to you. We will bring you back a report on the um, effectiveness of the ordinance or any changes uh, probably by the end of late summer or early fall. But in between now and then, we are proposing no fees specifically. And with respect to the dump elements, which we did hear that there were some concerns about how long it takes to go and dump their wastewater. Uh, again, any lawful uh, wastewater dump is allowable. It doesn't have to go to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we will talk with folks about that and, and, and what options there are, just as long as it doesn't go down the storm drains or down the sewers. That's, been, that's the impact that the state has on us. So we will bring back a report, but I just want to reassure the community that our intent is actually to keep folks working, keep cars clean. Uh, it's better for, for both uh, the environment and for us, but we do need to recognize the impact of state regulations and get our uh, community into compliance. Well, I know the state has been looking at us, and every now and then um, we've had people sue us because of that they don't think we're complying with regulations, and then when they find out that we actually are, which is in our favor. You know, I should have had Ms. Rojo um, do the translation on that. So can you remember enough of what Mr. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you? No, I'm good. But, I'm not that good. Okay. <laughs> I talk a lot. I apologize. Okay. Let's, let's try to do a translation because there are people out there that are, are not understanding this. So I'm going to ask you to... I'll, so I'll, I'll hit the high points. Hit the high points uh, and, that, and that we are going to be doing workshops to inform people. Yes, again, I, this is the city attorney, Tom Watson, who also is the eh, eh, chief eh, code enforcement officer. El abogado de la ciudad va a dar unos detalles acerca de qué es lo que va a pasar si la, la, la regulación es adoptada. I want to assure the community that our intent is to keep people in business and employed. El abogado dice que quiere asegurar que el intento es de mantener a todos empleados, es nomás de, de seguir las reglas eh, del, del Estado. My team will be advertising an educational workshop for people to be educated about the needs that they have under the new ordinance. Habrán talleres para educar a la comunidad acerca de lo que es necesario para seguir las reglas. And that will be in English and Spanish. Y va a ser en español y en inglés. We want to encourage small business people to continue to operate in the city of Santa Maria. Queremos apoyar a que continúen a, a seguir a los negocios aquí en la, en la ciudad de Santa Maria. We will not be um, seeking to have fees for the um, uh, ordinance until probably fall. En el momento no, no habrá infracciones. Eso a lo mejor um, hablarán más uh, acerca de eso en el otoño. Our intent is to get car washers back to being mobile. El intento es de hacer los, los que están ofreciendo car wash más móviles. 
and we will work with the car wash community to see if there are any difficult parts of the ordinance that should be changed. Y eh, la, la ciudad trabajará con los que están ofreciendo car wash, a móviles, para a, tratar de, de arreglar cualquier uh, re, irregulación que, que, que esté um, que, que esté afectando la regulación que, que están implementadas en la ciudad. If there's a difficulty with getting water to the wastewater treatment plant, the water can be um, deposited in any lawful dumping station. Si hay problemas eh, en donde llevar el, el agua, um, puede llevarlo a cualquier lugar donde se pueda tirar uno el agua. We want to encourage uh, our local community to be prosperous and we continue to be a business friendly uh, town for our small businesses. Queremos que prosperen los negocios y, y nosotros queremos apoyar a, a todos los que están tratando de, de sobrevivir con sus negocios. Thank, thank Gracias. You. Thank you, Mr. O. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that the people know that there, there's been a lot of disinformation. It's just basically we want people to have a business license. Uh, we want them to be in compliance when they discharge the water. And we want them to be mobile. And that you will be doing informational groups, both in Spanish and English, to inform people. And if things need to be tweaked a little bit, then we'll, we'll fix them. Thank you. Any comments from? Council members, uh, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Watson, for uh, explaining that. I, I, I just want to uh, say some things that are going to need to be translated as well. These, these regulations that the city of Santa Maria is putting into effect are, yes, they're written on the city stationary and their city regulations, but they're in place to comply with the state demands. It's not just Santa Maria that is deciding we're going to do this. This is being demanded by the state. Is that correct, Mr. Watson? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Would you? Sure. Eh, el miembro del concilio El señor Cordero quiere que sepan todos los que están escuchando que estas regulaciones, aunque son implementadas por la ciudad de Santa María, en realidad están viniendo del Estado y el Estado es el, el que está, es, está diciéndole a la ciudad de Santa María que necesitamos implementar estas reglas. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to, to uh, yes. make that uh, uh, Thank you. emphasized. Yeah. And you know, I heard um, Mr. Estrada was concerned because he does commercial trucks, but he also does that on private property. So that does, that does not impact him, right? Again, we'll be working with the, those yeah. issues as well. Okay. So, but again, we can't really dialogue this, but I did want to respond to the comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. Thank you, Ms. Rojo. Okay, moving on to the consent calendar. Madam Clerk, could you please read to, um, item number three? Routine items are presented for city council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion. These items are discussed only on the request of council members. Does anyone wish to have items pulled for discussion? Madam Mayor, I'd like yes. to pull item 3C for a separate vote and discussion. 3C. 3C, did you say? Yes, 3C, the second reading and adoption of ordinance 20. 2102 regulating mobile car washing. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I was going to ask to pull that same one, so that's oh, fine. Oh, okay. Uh, Madam Mayor, yes. If there's nothing else to be submitted. I would like to adopt the consent calendar with omitting item number 3C. Okay. I have a motion to approve. Second. And I have a second. Um, so, any further discussion on that? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Council Member Escobedo? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Okay, 3C. Council Member Soto? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, would, I would like to start by asking some clarifying questions, if I may. 
Um, the first question is regarding the, the, the bond deposits. If you can please explain that part of the ordinance as it was a bit unclear. I believe it read $20,000 for individuals seeking permits and $10,000 for charity permits. Can you please elaborate and explain that further to me? And if you could go name that section so we can um, follow along. Oh, goodness. Oh, I think it was towards the end. Okay. Page. Insurance and securities? No. Securities. Okay. Yes. Section 421.18, page, page Thank you. 9. I've got paid one. 421 point what? 18. I can actually help answer that question. Um, it, that sounds as if like a scary number, which I would have thought the exact same thing. So um, basically when you do a bond like that or a surety, it's 25 to 3% of the total. So you're looking at roughly 250 to $500 on that range from the $10,000 to the $20,000. And you would get that back in the end. It basically is a surety bond that you would have with the city. So if there were any um, damages or anything like that that happened to city property while you were operating, um, it would basically be a, provide a bond saying that you would pay for damages. So it's like the uh, construction bonds that we yeah. do, that we give them back in the end, okay. So it's it's, it's and it's the, only it, it, two and a half to three percent. It is oh, not of the twenty thousand. Of the twenty thousand. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. it is not the whole thing. Okay. And <laughs> how would you determine whether it's the two or the three percent? Um, that's just whatever the company that you went with well, to purchase the bond. Got it. And then um, my other question is regarding liability insurance. I read that it would be um, required that they have a minimum general liability insurance in the amount of $1 million. Is that um, customary? Is that is that just like? That's, uh, that's kind of standard for standard. any business practice. That is our standard amount. And technically, because they're mobile, it's it would be a vehicle. It would be on their vehicle policy anyway. So they have a general mm -hmm. policy attached to their vehicle policy because they have a vehicle running that stuff around. Got it. And then my other question is regarding fees. I know that Mr. Watson was um, shared that there would be no fees, but in the ordinance there's talk about a utility disposal facility permit fee. And okay. so, um, that's enough. I'm super excited. I have that answer too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, to discharge, if you have a wastewater discharge permit, it's 12 cents per gallon. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't have, there's not any restrictions. I know there were a lot of misconceptions in the beginning um, that after the first ordinance kind of went out um, or the first reading that you were going to have to go with massive tanks and you would have, you, you can but there's actually no requirement for size of tank or anything like that. All it is is that it has to be discharged appropriately and collected appropriately to meet the state requirements. So if you take it out to the wastewater treatment plant, you do not have to go to Salinas um, for mobile car washes, but if you take it to the wastewater treatment plant, it's 12 cents um, per gallon. So if you had a 100 gallon tank, which is a pretty massive size, it's 12 bucks. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. And um, another question regarding that is um, the 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 what it, the the treatment the not the treatment the wastewater, wastewater. thank the you wastewater. the wastewater plant. Um, I've been hearing concerns from folks about um, the long wait times due to the folks who own um, like portable sanitation companies, and so. Um, I guess my question, I don't know if this would be to you or if Mr. Springer is on the line on what the, um, whether or not we, we have, not that we don't have capacity, but what will that, what will the impact of having over a hundred mobile car, I'm just throwing it out, if we have like a hundred mobile car washes now needing to go to the wastewater treatment plan, how will that impact um, staffing and just impact? Yeah, actually, uh, Councilmember Soto through the mayor. That, so that we're actually better prepared for that than we have been in the past. A couple of years ago, we um, had a council-approved um, 
capital project in order to redo the um, dump area there, the RV, the water, the wastewater dump area. And so we do have an automated process, so it doesn't require the staff anymore to run back and forth. Um, the people who go there regularly can get a, a card and be able to just go in and swipe the card and, and it unlocks the facility for them to be able to use it. So it's a lot easier and a lot more capacity now than we had even a couple of years ago. But I, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah, that's neat. so fancy. Um, <laughs> um, my, my, uh, my other question is regarding, um, is, is about how we would measure um, the water usage, and I don't know if that's based off tanks. I know that in the ordinance I'd read that um, folk, if, if folks would be getting a permit for um, water, with, with water, for like washing with water and not waterless, that they would need to contain 95% of the water usage and with like a 5% of, of like over, not overflow, is that over? Evaporation, well, probably. Okay. And, and How again, would you measure that? Yeah, again, that goes back to our reasonability on enforcement. Because one of the reasons that we, that we have such detail in this is because we were having so many in a stationary area that we were seeing it go into those drains. Again, in a, in a mobile scenario, we're not going to be following them around and identifying this. We're relying, to a great extent, on the operators acting appropriately. So we're putting in those standards because that's the standards we receive. But, but we're going to be, again, trying to work with the operators to, to have it be reasonable. The biggest thing is the concentration when you have a non-mobile scenario, you have a great level of concentration. When they're dispersed into the community, that impact is less and we're not going to be going around doing drop-by-drop -drop analysis. Mm -hmm. um, got it. And then my last question has to do with, um, again, capacity. Um, in the ordinance, it talks about um, folks who risk, who, who mobile car wash owners needing to submit um, reports where they record keep the, the number of um, washes that they do per month and that they need to submit it on the 25th. Who would that be submitted to and, and what would be the purpose of that? Um, I can explain the second purpose. The, the purpose really is, again, if we saw a, a mobile operator in front of an apartment building for five or six hours, we would want to identify that there were people from that apartment building that were coming to get their car washes and not people coming from across town to a stationary facility. Sorry, I, I'm having a hard time hearing No, I, I, I apologize. What I'm saying is if we have someone who's parked in front of an apartment complex, we want to be able to verify that the cars that are getting washed are from that complex and not coming from across town. Oh, I see. And, and again, that is something that is part of the education process. We'll identify uh, what's appropriate. We've put it in, but enforcement is all about trust between the community and the enforcement arm. And we're going to try and establish that. So while it's in there, if that becomes onerous or if that becomes a problem, um, we will not be enforcing that but, but coming back for an adjustment. But that's the purpose. The purpose is to have some verification if we have a stationary individual that we can then make sure that they're not just setting up camp and having folks come from all over town and Orchid and everywhere else. And in terms of capacity and who would those records be submitted to? Um, they actually will come to our office and so we'll take a peek at those. Um, they can be simple. They don't have to be super detailed. You can get, I mean, there's the easy process of you have a sheet of paper or you have receipts from when you dumped your water, um, you know, a list of who you did and um, or vehicles and locations and then if you did eight cars that day and or over like a three or four day period, and then you went to the um, wastewater disposal site and then dumped your water, you could mark it off on your little list for this was where I dumped and it was this amount of cars. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's just kind of making sure, again, we're ensuring mobility and um, that things are being disposed of appropriately and it's not continuing to go into um, people's flower beds and storm drains and everything else. Thank you. And then um, I, I, 
It's not so much a question, but a point. Um, it was brought to my attention that in years past, we've had um, like brochures that talk about mobile car washing. And I believe I saw on there that, um, and maybe I'm, I'm I, I, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but I thought I saw on there that um, folks would be able to dispose the water like on trees. <laughs> and so I, I don't know if I saw that correctly or not, but um, on that same brochure, I do remember um, there being like images of folks putting sandbags on the stormwater drains to prevent from the water flowing into the drain. Would that be something that we would be, we would be able to to do rather than asking them to do a whole holding tank? Um, the, it's, it's kind of, I think, misunderstood with that. Um, when, it, I, I know what flyer you mean. Um, it's a, actually a pretty neat flyer. It's got some great details in it. Um, but when you're putting something off and you're berming it, the intent is at the end you're gonna collect. All it's doing, all it they're saying is, is if you have a storm drain here, your water can't go in it, and your water can't just sit. So you can berm it off like you're supposed to, but when you're finished, you're supposed to then collect that water so that it gets disposed of properly. It's not supposed to sit in the street or the gutter afterwards. Thank you. Th those are all the questions um, I have at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think in listening to some of the people that spoke at public comment, there's a, I, I believe there's a misunderstanding of the water systems that we have, the disposal system. And we actually have two systems. There is the stormwater system that we don't want this water from the car washes to get involved with. And then we have the system that we have that is connected to our homes, the sewer system that goes through the wastewater treatment plant. And um, I heard some people commenting on their, on their, um, with their comments that the water going into the sewer system, and that's, that's not really the case, depending on, on how you're talking about it. So. Perhaps, if you're not the right person, then we need to get the right person uh, to explain the difference between the two systems right. and the system that we're trying to protect at the direction, again, of the state of California and maybe our multi-purpose person over here, Rosie, could, could help you do that. <laughs> so you can do this kind of like a duet. <laughs> so, do you want me to uh, kind of introduce what you're going to explain? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, it's basically explaining the um, two two systems of uh, well, I just I, I just need, need to the system. system. Two ways of, of different systems. Well, it's kind of yeah, it's stormwater versus. Um, versus your sewer water. This my, is two different systems. My suggestion is that you give the answer and then she repeats your answer in, 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 uh, in those little short comments. Okay. Explain the difference in the two systems after you've given a few or, or 45 seconds or so of your explanation and she can pick it up and then you can finish and she can pick it up. Okay. Um, when thinking in terms of wastewater in our homes versus storm drains that we see throughout the city, we actually have two separate systems um, in place. Yeah, and they go. To you're, you're, excuse me. You're, you're speaking to the people outside. Don't. You're not speaking to her. You're speaking to, no, speaking, to speaking to the people in the microphone so they can hear you in the public. Just, and then she will do it just a translation. And speak into the mic so that, that oh, we can get the... Can you not the, hear me? I thought yes. I was speaking yes. into the mic. Yes. You're quiet anyway. I know. Here, you want to speak? Storm. Well, I just want to make sure I have the verbiage right, because this is now getting into the technical. So, so, are we talking when we 
Yeah, that's different. That's different from your home. Okay. Your potties are different from the drains in the street. I'm collector de aguas pulviales. That's what Google says. So we're talking okay. about el drenaje de la de, de la casa a comparación al drenaje de la calle. Okay. okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure I, because right. there's Google Speak and then there's Google yeah. Speak and then like I understand. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So who wants to do the English version? Yeah. If you think that they did, I'm happy with you. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just explained the two differences. Okay. Okay. So. Estamos tratando de explicar la diferencia entre los drenajes de la casa y el drenaje de la calle. El drenaje de la casa, where does that go? The one in the house. El drenaje de la casa va al, al vertedero uh, donde se trata el agua, la, el agua sucia. Y el agua de la calle va a, a, va a la playa, va al océano. Uh, ajá. Así es que eh, la, la agua de la casa va al, al vertedero y el agua de la calle va al océano. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions, Mr. Cordero, or comments? No, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. I, I, think, I think people need to understand when, when we get complaints, but the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, gets complaints. Then they let us know that they've had complaints. And, and we need to react uh, to those complaints and, and install regulations. And we're not trying to be heavy-handed. We are just, uh, we just can't have this, uh, this, this discharge going down on stormwater out to the ocean. And so we have a responsibility here as council members to make sure that uh, we put in these regulations. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. And we're not trying to put people out of business. So, um, and, and I applaud those parents who are taking their, their kids to work and showing them how to work and giving them a good work, work ethic. So, um, Okay, and I, I think it's really important that the public knows this. I also got uh, an email from a woman who um, is elderly. She can't, she can't do wash her own car. This is convenient for her to have someone to come to her home to wash her car and detail if it's necessary. This is not going to have the impact on that. Right, Mr. Watson? Again, we encourage, we encourage yeah. the, the mobility of this. We want the mobility. We want the compliance so, the wa so that the discharge water isn't going down to the ocean. We want them to uh, have a business license, and we want the mobility. And that's what they say, they're mobile car washes. Okay. Ms. Waterfield. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Watson, my, my question is under Section 4-2122, no person shall hire, engage, or use mobile commercial washing services which does not have a valid mobile commercial washing permit from the city. Does that mean the employees that they hire have to have a permit? No, it's simply, it's simply by the organization or the, pers the person who is taking the money, okay. not the employees thereof. Okay, uh, that would have been page 9 at the very bottom. And then on page 8, uh, section 4-21, Point one five. It says that Section A, mobile commercial washing is banned from all city streets, easements, and city-owned properties. Uh, my example of my uh, car washer coming to my house, he has to do it on the street. He can't do it in my driveway because it it wouldn't work. And, and and again, you know, this this is how it's been drafted. Okay. If that if that turns out to be a, a significant heart handicap, we'll come back to it. Uh, but what we're trying to do is we're encouraging it to be on private property because then it's easier to control. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, my folks are going to be out looking for compliance, not looking for enforcement. 
That's really the intent. And if, the, if, if ultimately, if someone did look at your car being washed in the street, call us. Uh, frankly, these guys and gals are pretty fast. They probably beat us to it, and uh, we'd come back and, and just see if there was any residue, because that's the other thing, trying to eliminate residue in the streets. So what if someone had a big front yard? Could they just drive their car up on that yard and have it washed? Again, re reasonability, that's one of the reasons why we want to have an educational con Perfect. conversation with the car washers so they know what's the most appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Because we want the intent to be understood by the, the folks as well. And the intent is to eliminate the runoff that we've had. And the intent is we're not stopping anybody from doing any type of car washing, mobile car washing business at all whatsoever. We're encouraging it. The difficulty, we're, we're, we are at a, <coughs> at, a, at a juggernaut because we're in a situation where the state is constantly in, mm -hmm. in drought. There's issues related to water. There, the, the, this is a industry that ultimately will probably have to go waterless because state regulations will probably prohibit, you know, gallons of water being used for car washes that is not recycled. But for right now, what we're trying to do is that baby step. Right. Well, Get I know, our folks uh, where they need to be. I know with the Water Quality Regional Board, they are very stringent in what runs off into our uh, storm drains because they regulate what goes into the rivers and into the ocean, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get to the point where we have to make sure that the water that comes off our roofs when it rains does not go down the storm drain. And that's another project that they're working on, and it's just going to affect everybody who lives under a roof here. And I, it's just, we live in California. It's an environmental, you know, state, and uh, some of the laws are great, and some of them are just, you know, a little out there. So, but I just want people to understand that we're not stopping them from doing their business. They become compliant um, like every other business does in the city of Santa Maria. And that would be a very good lesson to teach the children that they're bringing along them that when you do have a business, these are the rules you have to play by. And everybody has to do this. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the council? Are we in discussion now? Comments, uh, Mr. Escobedo. Yeah, yeah, that was my uh, my question. Is it going to be uh, this discussion or just general yes. comments? Okay. So uh, when I uh, assume the position as a city council member, I swore to to respect and comply with the with the laws, even if we don't like them. Uh, and most of the time, we usually seen as because we're the closer closest to the community, as we are the one just pointing at, uh, down and you know this coming from the state and 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 I had the opportunity of speaking with some uh, mobile car wash owners during these weeks I went straight and we have a conversation and I do agree I think it's a there's a big misinformation out there uh, and after having a conversation a couple of uh, minutes they uh, understood uh, what was it about so I think it's uh, having these workshops uh, educational workshops are necessary and because it's they understood that it's not about us attacking them or their way of living it's about how we can how they can adjust their activity inside a, fra um, a legal framework and I would like also to say in Spanish if, uh, it was, um, cuando asumí la, la gran responsabilidad de ser consejero de la ciudad y tomé la decisión de respetar y, y seguir las leyes a, a pesar de que estas no nos puedan, no nos gusten en el caso del, de los eh, de esta regulación por lo general se ve al consejo de la ciudad como el malo o el que está eh, dañando por, pero esa es una regulación que viene desde el estado y Santa María está un paso estamos tratando de hacer ese paso que que, que nos están de alguna manera eh, forzando las leyes estatales durante las, esas semanas he tenido la oportunidad de ir y platicar frente a frente con varios dueños de car wash móviles y, y, y después de una conversación tuve la eh, ellos entendieron cuál era la situación y creo que ese es el gran reto que tenemos la desinformación que se, eh, se expuso se creó este estado de pánico pero no estamos aquí para trabajar en equipo en la comunidad el consejo de la ciudad y 
y esta regulación no es para atacar o para sacar de la, del, del trabajo a, a la familia, sino para que pueda esta actividad económica ser eh, llevada a cabo dentro del marco de la ley. Eh, so that's, uh, that's all, uh, that's my comment, so thank you. Thank you. That's just what I was going to say. Good, I'm glad. Ms. Sutter, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Um, I, I guess I can just make it once the motion and the second is made. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I have a motion and a second. And any further discussion? Ms. Soto? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I want to start by um, thanking our city, our city staff for, for, for bringing this forward back to us after the conversation that we had last summer. And for me, my stance is still very much, uh, not my stance, but my concern is still very much an environmental one and how this will, and how this impacts, um, you know, our, our oceans and, um, you know, our rivers because of the pollutants that go into the storm water drains. Um, however, after, after having conversations with the mobile car wash owners and also um, during the conversation that we had here on the dais, I, I, I am concerned at the fact that um, as, happy as, I am, as happy as I am that we're moving forward with um, providing workshops for folks around um, how this ordinance will impact them, I often find that we as council members may make decisions and take on votes and create policies and ordinances um, without really talking to the folks first about how these policies will ultimately impact them. Um, I know that we've done it in the past, you know, with um, developers where we, we come to the table and we talk about, you know, whether it may be a fee system or, or whatnot, and we try to find some way to compromise. Um, and I'm saddened that we didn't take the time to do that with this ordinance, that we didn't take the time to first learn about, um, and I'm not saying that, that you all didn't do that, but definitely the conception in the community is that we didn't take the time to sit with folks and to, um, and to hear from them and what their concerns are on, on imposing an ordinance such as this before it coming to the council. And so I think for future, no, I would really like to see this process be one where um, we, we take into consideration the folks who are most impacted by the policies that we, that we vote on and that we put in place prior to us um, being in the position that we are, that we find ourselves in now. Thank you. And you know, uh, I, I know we did that with H2A, but that was sort of brand new for us, the H2A. But when we did the flower vendors and we've done other ordinances, um, we do because we have to comply with, with what the state comes down and tells us. But I think um, we are going to be listening so that if we need to make adjustments to this, uh, and it's very important to listen to all the people in Santa Maria and how it's going to impact them. So, um, but thank you very much for your comments. Okay, so uh, do I? First and second. I have a first and second, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield. Aye. Councilmember Cordero. No. Councilmember Soto. No. Councilmember Escobedo. Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Okay, I'd like to switch the order of the last two items and take the regular business item first. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title of item 5A? The City Council will consider the vision, guiding principles, and areas of change and stability general plan update. Okay, and Mr. That's not Mr. Ang, okay. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Good evening. Mayor. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Dana Eady. I'm the Acting Planning Manager in Community Development. And uh, we're going to be giving you a general plan update presentation this evening. And the presentation is going to be made by Mr. Ron Whitmore with Ramey and Associates. And he should be available uh, through Zoom. Thank you. 
Mr. Witt. There you go. I was just going to let you know you have um, control of the mouse and the presentation. No, I've shared the presentation for you. Okay. Yeah. And if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit uh, louder into your microphone, that would be very helpful. Uh, maybe a little louder. <laughs> louder. You're gonna, you're gonna have to speak up. Let's, let's go ahead like you are, and, and if we find that it's, it's too low, then maybe we'll have you call in. Thank you. Madam Mayor, apparently um, the public can't hear uh, Mr. Whitmore. Okay. So um, I think we might have to ask you to call in. Um, yeah. Unless Dana. Yeah, I can probably just go ahead and walk through the presentation. I would just, um, I'll just say next slide. Um, so this slide is just giving an overview of the planning process and we're currently in the second phase, which is the listening and visioning phase. Um, so the last few months, as Ron was mentioning, we were going through just looking at existing conditions in the city. We developed a number of uh, different existing conditions reports on the city, so in areas of u utilities and transportation and um, mobility and things like that. Um, so moving forward, um, the next phase would be the plan alternatives phase. And so um, this slide is showing just the general decision-making process. Um, we uh, have many different workshops and um, get a lot of input from community members and stakeholders, and then that's provided uh, you know, to the planning commission and then to your council. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, we had um, an initial engagement phase where um, we developed a website in English and in Spanish. It's imaginesantamaria.com. Um, we also had a number of stakeholder interviews. We've had seven technical advisory committee meetings so far. Um, we've also had a, a couple of different online surveys that were in July and September of last year. And then we had two public visioning workshops last year. Those were in November and December. Um, and, and then we also had uh, planning commission hearings, uh, department advisory group meetings, and, and also a city council meeting back in October. Next slide, please. Oh. 
Nope, did I go the wrong way? Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so this just summarizes those existing conditions reports I was talking about. Um, there's environmental report, and I, I mentioned this already, but land use and community design, health and equity, demographics, housing, eco economic, and market. And all of those, all of those reports are posted on the, um, the website, imaginesantamaria.com, if anyone would like to take a look at those. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're in the second phase of the, the general plan update now, and that includes developing the vision, guiding principles, and areas of change and stability um, for the city. And um, we did have, like I said, some community workshops and surveys last year to um, get some input from the community on what they would like to see Santa Maria be like in the next 25 years, and so the year 2045. And, um, we took the draft vision statement and guiding principles and this document to the planning commission for a study session in February. And then we had a hearing just last month, month in March where it was recommended uh, for approval to your city council for today's hearing. Next slide, please. Um, and so one of the, um, some of the visioning engagement work that we did was a workshop, and we asked um, participants in the workshop to assist us in identifying uh, areas within Santa Maria where um, we might be missing, um, there might be missing assets or challenges in the city, or, and we also asked them what is their uh, highest priority of qualities to preserve and enhance in Santa Maria what types of changes are most important to them, and where in the city should the general plan focus. And then we also asked just what big ideas do community members have for Santa Maria. And so what we learned from all of that engagement, we actually took all of that information and we put it together into a vision statement for, that describes Santa Maria, Santa Maria in the year 2045. And along with that, um, we developed some guiding principles, and those are directions to follow to essentially achieve the vision that's been developed. And then the other part of the document is the areas of stability and change. And those are areas that were identified where uh, changes um, could occur within Santa Maria or improvements could be made within Santa Maria. Um, and then there's areas of transformation that were identified, and that's really where transformational change or big changes, plan changes could occur in the city. Um, and so we still have some unanswered questions, um, mainly related to the downtown area, like really what's the future of downtown, how will that be revitalized, um, areas where the city could potentially expand in the future. And so those questions will be looked at in the next phases, which are phases three and four um, after this uh, document that we're presenting tonight gets approval. Next slide, please. Uh, so this just talks about the methodology that we use to develop the vision statement. Um, we took all of that information that we gained in the existing conditions reports, interviews, and surveys, and we looked at all of that and then put together in that document qualities of Santa Maria that we want to preserve, maybe some opportunities to look at for the future, and then challenges and changes as well. So this is the draft vision statement for 2045. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. Santa Maria in 2045 is a community where families can establish and maintain multi-generational roots. It is close-knit, culturally diverse, and economically inclusive. This is possible in part because Santa Maria offers affordable, safe, attractive, and healthy homes and neighborhoods for all residents. This is also possible because of the availability of high quality education, jobs, and economic opportunity. Building from a strong foundation in the agricultural, retail, healthcare, and business service industries, Santa Maria has continued to diversify by expanding the training and skills of residents and by adapting to new technologies and broader economic trends. And there's a little more to it. People are proud of their history and heritage. 
This is reflected in the diverse, well-preserved historical resources and the attractive, inviting streets and public gathering places. Museums, art venues, a strong civic sector, and the many welcoming community events and celebrations are all evidence of a vibrant local culture. Residents have convenient access on foot and by car, bus, and bicycle to jobs, school, community amenities like parks and sports fields, and the region's natural environment. Public services are reliable, inclusive, and efficient, and the community is well served by equitable, modern, and sustainable infrastructure, facilities, and utilities. And so this is just a list of the draft guiding principles that are in the draft document we provided to you. Um, it has all the different subjects that we took a look at, and uh, those are areas that are going to be focused on in our general plan update. Next slide. This is a map that shows the draft areas of change and stability. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, a lot of this information was um, gained from the work, the public workshops and outreach that was completed um, in the, as part of phase one of the project. And so looking at this map, the areas of stability enhancement, which are areas that are mostly built out where these are areas that can be enhanced, um, are the northwest, northeast, and southeast neighborhoods. And then the areas of potential transformation are the downtown area, neighborhoods in the, in the city core, the southwest neighborhoods, main and Broadway corridors. And then we also have some areas that are identified for potential annexation and expansion, and that's you know the northwest or out to the east. Next slide, please. So again, um, the next phases of the project, we're just going to take a look at these questions. So you know, what's the future of downtown? Um, how can competing needs be balanced along Main and Broadway um, between you know putting in more multimodal types of trans transportation for walking, biking? but um, continue to allow Main and Broadway to be um, you know, utilized for uh, business needs. And then how and where should Santa Maria grow? So as I mentioned, um, the next phase is gonna be the plan alternatives and we're looking at late spring and summer of this year. And so we're gonna be developing land use maps, visual renderings and some alternatives analysis to look at um, potential land use changes that could occur in the city. And then after that, the fourth phase is doing some policy and plan development, and that would be in the fall. And this just gives an example of what you're going to see as part of the plan alternative. So this is an example of a land use scenario where um, the first scenario is looking um, at doing development kind of more around the edges of that city. Uh, this is not Santa Maria, it's just a city. <laughs> and then the second um, alternative is, is looking more at infill development. And then as part of that, we will also have um, some visualizations of changes that could potentially occur within the city. And again, this is not Santa Maria in particular. It's just giving you an idea of what to expect. And um, this is just looking at the type of alternatives analysis that we would look at. So looking at existing and then what you would expect with each of those alternatives. So developing on the, expanding the city essentially versus doing some infill development. Next slide, please. And um, I know you can't read this, it's just giving you an idea of what the policy and plan development um, will look like when um, we start putting that together for you. So our, our recommendation is that uh, the city council by motion approve the draft vision, guiding principles, and areas of change and stability document that we provided to you. Um, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Questions, Ms. Waterfield. Dana, when was the last time we did an update on the general plan? Well, um, I believe it's been at least 20 years. Okay. Um, and Director Ng could probably confirm that for me. There's uh, different chapters of the general plan that has uh, different dates that has been last updated, but the majority of the chapters 
in the existing general plan was updated in the 90s. In the 90s. Okay, just in case I get asked that question in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Escobedo. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, can we go a, two slices back in the presentation, please? Uh, oh, that one. So uh, can you explain and elaborate a little bit of what's uh, alternative one or two? Yes, Council Member Escobedo through the mayor. Um, so like, for example, the, it says total population existing 60,000. And so alternative one would add, um, it'd be 60,800. And then, and it, it actually is tied to that previous slide I was showing with the two different maps. That's where that's coming from. So if you went with alternative one, the idea is that that could increase it by up to 67,800 or alternative two, which was doing more infill development, you would have maybe fewer at 67,100. So that's what you would expect to see as part of our plan alternative analysis for Santa Maria is something to that. So the, um, so the alternative one would be infill and this two, it would be. So Alternative Extension. one was at the uh, is on the left, and that's um, more at the um, at the edges of the city. And then alternative two is looking more infill development inside the existing city. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I think Mr. Ng would like to add something to that. Mayor, uh, council members, as, as we move into the next phase of the general plan, you'll likely see. Uh, more than two uh, alternatives. Um, that's dependent on the analysis that we're going to do in coming up with the different growth scenarios. So as you know, we have uh, projections for year 2045 for population, households, and employment. So we're looking at a population of roughly uh, 140,000 and also an increase in uh, the number of residential units and an increase in the number of jobs. And the next phase is an analysis of how those will be distributed. Uh, where will the housing be? Where will the jobs be? How dense will the housing be? And so there will be enough scenarios to do a comparison and a contrast for us to analyze what's best for the city moving forward. The, what you see on this side is just a example of what we're going to do. And the scenarios will be looked at not just in land use, but how it impacts transportation and the, and the ability for the city to provide services. And that includes recreation, public safety, and impact on infrastructure and utilities. It's kind of a holistic, comprehensive analysis. And because we understand that land use has impacts on other aspects of quality of life. Well, I, whoever, uh, I think you said there was room for growth on the northwest side. Where? So if we go to that map, um, so that came out of some surveys that we did. And um, yes, that's the correct, thank you. And, um, and yes, that area was um, mentioned as potentially doing some expansion. Where? Um, west. Yeah, it's northwest. I'm just trying to picture. Um, so. West of Blosser? Yeah, it's. <laughs> right, it would require annexation, and it's in that more agricultural area. Why would we be going into ag land? I think we had a buffer there at one time, and what happened to that? Because I know the high school district wanted to build the high school there years ago, and we said, no, you couldn't do that, because once you start building, that just puts a stop on ag land because there's all the restrictions of, of housing residential and ag land. Why would we even think of going west of Blosser? Well, again, this is a draft map, and it was 
taken from a lot of surveys and a lot of public input that we received. Um, again, it would require annexation, and there's a process, you know, to go through that. Well, I realize but, that. Yeah. But once we say, yeah, it's okay, then everyone will they'll come back and say, well, you guys voted on it. I mean, you must be in favor of it. Well, it will yeah. be, yeah. It would be the council's um, ultimate decision on this. I, I think what Ms. Edie and Mr. Ng are saying is we... At this point, we did a survey, that was, so we recognize with the RENA numbers and the state numbers that we're going to have to accommodate growth. And so we did a survey also of hearing what people were looking for for the type of growth. It kind of balanced in, at least into those two scenarios of trying to grow within or grow without, um, and that there's probably going to be a balance between those and, like Chun said, maybe even a few other options. So. Um, so we're just, at this point, it's conceptual options. How would we fit all this into a city? And we could fit it with our current footprint. It would be really hard, and it'll really change some of our neighborhood characteristics, or we could do it with a balance of some annexation or not. And one thought on, the, on that Northwest that also came out was it could also potentially provide another um, access point to divert trucks off of Broadway and Main uh, reduce the impact on 101, not have trucks coming across town, and then have another bridge going north of the river connecting to 166. So and we talked to Slow County and we, We've had that conversation over and over. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. No, and it it's, just, I mean, it's, but it's we're, not we're reality. Still, yeah, we're right. still, well, 200 million bucks, it could be <laughs> yeah. reality. But, <laughs> but we're still very conceptual at this, and it will be uh, for the council. And so at this point, it is really vision and principles of how we would go there. Then we will start getting into the details of drawing it on the map and where would we go and would we want to annex this or that? Where would the urban growth boundaries be? And then again, as Dana mentioned and Chun, that, that's still at that point is just potentially updating our sphere of influence and getting that approved through LAFCO and then going through future annexations. And you're right, that if the annexations, if they're within our sphere of influence, there is some tacit and actual real approval from the council to proceed with those. No, I know we're going to have to, I, I think we're going to have to do annexations, and that's going to be really touchy, but I see it as going east and, and never going west. Okay. Ms. Soto? Thank you. I mean, I, not so much a question, but more like a thought and a comment based on the presentation and based on these result, uh, based on this particular slide. Um, and I've had this conversation with Mr. Stillwell in the past just about um, the importance of making sure that we have um, efficient and equitable connectivity for the residents in the north part of town to um, where now our main shopping areas are, which are all the way to the south part of town. Um, and I know that it, we, at least I've heard from residents how that has been an issue, but then also the conversation about like um, parks and recreation and how the way that we've started to grow or the way that we've developed and grown, at, at least in this present time, I just find that it's so um, thoughtful. It's thoughtful in the way that we're constantly thinking about like um, making sure that we have accessible parks for, for the residents in that particular neighborhood. And so, um, you know, I'm interested to see based on, based on, I'm interested to see what future conversations um, what ideas come up from, from future conversations about how we can further enhance the quality of life um, when it comes to accessible like transportation and recreation, not parks, parks um, for the folks in, in the north part of, of town. Ms. Waterfield? You know what I find it so fascinating with Santa Maria? I came here in 1985 and we were the hub of manufacturing and industry and doing all of those, you know, blue collar worker jobs that we just, we pumped it out. It was just absolutely awesome. And I see how we have transpired to the technology area, not so much industry and manufacturing anymore because that's just the way uh, the the world is changing in, in those spots and I just I'm glad to see that we've uh, we've kept up with the trends along with education uh, Alan Hancock has done extremely well the universities that have come to Santa Maria have are doing ex exceptionally well, well as well 
But one thing that I would like to see, and I know it's going to be pricey for the city of Santa Maria in some way that we can work this in to the general plan with in pockets, is um, uh, uh, city council uh, member Soto had mentioned recreation. We need swimming pools. We have only have one for the entire city, and we've got a lot of a lot of people from the elderly to the little ones that like to swim. And uh, some way within that 2045 era, we can we can get a swimming pool or two added to the to the city of Santa Maria. So that I would I would love to see that for our community. Mr. Escobedo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And yeah, uh, comment. I had the opportunity of attending one of the, war, uh, the meetings, the workshops that, put, that was put together before the pandemic. It was a really interesting and really big. It was a huge group of people and with different backgrounds. And then we make small groups and they're talking about uh, what we had, uh, what we'd like to see, how we'd like to, uh, how, do we, how would we would like Santa Maria to be in 20, 30, 50 years and it was a really good unfortunately for the pandemic happens and yeah we couldn't uh, keep having those uh, huge uh, in-person workshops and some of this the the input i've been receiving then the campaign happened and people started sharing with me about housing and recreation activities for for the family as a whole so i'm looking forward to see uh, santa maria that provide more affordable housing for everybody uh, and how we can manage a sustainable growth because uh, we have to be really mindful of the way we're going to grow if it's going to be expanding if it's going to be go up and so i'm looking forward to having those big conversations and input from everybody and see a summary that it's uh, what we vision that we would like to see a uh, place for our families to grow and and enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. In uh, listening to what you're saying and, and and hearing some of the other comments that are being made, uh, as Mrs. Waterfield's comment, I mean. We're, we're not that far away from 50 years ago when she came here in 1985. I mean... Um, hey, 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 I was born in 89. So, <laughs> so, so we're talking about things that are going to take place and have taken place over many, many years. So I, I'm, I'm hearing what you have to say, but I'm kind of taking what you have to say as something that is, this isn't taking place next week. Uh, and, and, and we're... Uh, we should welcome the idea that you have many of these things to say, to look at for 2045 and 2050. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not too afraid of anything that you have to say. So let's, let's uh, listen to the more ideas we listen to, the better prepared we're going to be when the time comes that the actual decision makers who are probably in, first grade today, <laughs> uh, those decision makers can, can make those decisions from today forward, and they don't, you know, we're not making those, and none of us sitting up here today are going to make those decisions for 2045. So I appreciate what you're doing and how you're saying and the, the options that you're giving all of us as council people to look for and start to talk about. And I, I, I I, I don't know whether it's swimming pools or parks, but uh, you know those those opportunities for us to decide on those for these chairs to decide on those will come in in the many many years in the future for us to consider. So I I I don't know that we're spending maybe too much time on some of the specific things that we'd all like to have, but. We got to wait and see. Uh, I, the mayor, uh, I could tell just listening to her and watching her body language, she didn't want to go west. And uh, well, I we, said that, that we, not even my body language. Yeah. I said I didn't want to go she west. She doesn't want to go west, and and she <laughs> we, we can't go west. Well, the fact is that in 25 years, we may, we be. may be going west. 
uh, things may change to force us to go west. So uh, uh, um, I, I agree with her right now, uh, but the person that sits here in 2045 may not. So thank you very much for giving us these extra ideas for all of us to start thinking about today. And, and in terms of, if go I ahead, may, go ahead, and in terms of the vision um, that we have in front of us today, um, when I read it, I, 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 I thought it was just beautifully written, and I can very well imagine myself wanting to be part of this Santa Maria that you that with community input have been able with the vision that you all have been able to generate here and so um it's it's exciting to see so i'm curious to hear what the public comments no i no i that. i think yeah i think we have um and it's not that i'm trying to be negative because i i I've been to some of the focus groups, and I think things that people have put down there for the downtown specific plan mm -hmm. and, and for all the shrubbery at, at down Main Street, in, in order for us to have a downtown, it's going to have to be accessible to pedestrians. I know that. Um, and so that's going to be a little change and tweak in, in, in our environment. But I do think that when we plan things and if we make decisions that other um, boards and other council people have to deal with. Um, it, you know, I always think about the woman that came to the council, it wasn't too long ago, and she had a small child and lived not too far from here and wanted a park closer to her. And there isn't any room for a park closer to her. And so to oh, make sure- I remember that. And to make sure that we have those swimming mm -hmm. pools or we have those spaces that people can enjoy all over town so that they don't have to drive miles, you know, to get those things. That's, that's what really concerns me, because I think it's important. People like their neighborhoods. And um, with the RENA numbers coming out, we will have um, housing to do in the low income, in the medium, and in the high income. We really have a variety of housing that we're going to have to mm -hmm. put into Santa Maria, and I understand that. And, we, and I, I think it's really important, and I learned this years ago, it, it can't be just low income it's got to be high income because the people that are executive directors, that are the bosses, that want to live in, in, a, in a real, real, real nice home, we have to be able to accommodate them because if we don't, they move out of Santa Maria and then they don't belong to our Kiwanis clubs, our Rotary clubs, and which are giving back to our community, which benefits our kids. So it's like a cycle here. And then people will start at the bottom and then start move up, moving up into housing. So um, I'm, I'm glad we have a variety of housing to fill because I think that's really important. I think that's one of the attractions of Santa Maria, that there's just, there is a, a variety, but to, ha to know that in the future there'll be a greater variety for people to move here. You know, Madam Mayor, it's, it's interesting because when uh, Mr. Cordero mentioned the process of everything going along in, in 1985 when I arrived, I went to work for the Economic Development Association in 1991, and Enos was in the Williamson Act, and so they were talking about the 10 years it had to come out and the vision that they went through to what they were gonna do, and that went through so many uh, different uh, characters. It, it was just, oh gosh, it was just amazing. Today, it doesn't look like any of those designs that were from the past, but it's just, you know, the time does go by, and we do get there, and it's, it's, it's the councils that will take charge and push this on this way, like we will vote on this today. We may not ever see the result of what we voted on, but we got it started. We got it started so that these wonderful staff people can go and, and put their wonderful brains together and, and create uh, something wonderful with the community in mind and the community being a part of it. And I just, I just think it's just so exciting. I think of Union Valley Parkway, and oh I remember gosh. Larry Lavanino yeah. goes, probably not in my lifetime, yeah. and he's still alive. Absolutely. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any written correspondence? Madam Mayor, I do not have any written correspondence on this item, and I do have a few hands raised Request in to speak? And Zoom. Okay. Um, let's start with uh, Brian Hol Hollander has a hand up. Mr. Hollander, did you want to speak on this item or on uh, the CDBG item? Uh, I wanted to speak on the CDBG. 
Okay, I'll lower your hand and that will be the next item that comes up. So um, bear with us. <laughs> Okay, uh, Lori Tamora. Good evening. My Hi. name is Lori Tamora with Urban Planning Concepts and a longtime resident of the San Maria Valley. And uh, I want to first acknowledge uh, the effort that the city is doing in regards to updating the general plan. Uh, the last effort started in 1988, and it lasted till 1993. Uh, Think about that time frame when there were no computers, uh, there were no cell phones, there were no um, laptops, um, internet, um, and here we are 30 years later looking at our next plan. And I think the city of Santa Maria should be very proud of the effort that's occurred over the last 30 years because the city in all intent and purposes followed the plan from those leaders and decision makers and community members that participated in that last effort. Uh, one of the things that I always remember about city staff was that infrastructure was not gonna be a reason for stopping growth in Santa Maria. The city always went through a strong effort of looking for funding sources for their water system, sewer system, roads, drainage, so that um, there was no um, arbitrary limitation on the opportunities for growth in the city of Santa Maria. And I hope that policy and effort will continue as we move forward into the next generation of planning for the city of Santa Maria. Uh, it is important to note that the Greenbelt Agreement that was adopted by the both city, county, and the city of Guadalupe in 1993 and validated by LAFCO was the first time that that kind of an agreement was um, established in this valley. That, that agreement was a strong element because it, um, I'm going to almost say, forced landowners and developers to focus on building within the city of Santa Maria. So the idea that um, growth cannot happen because that Greenbelt Agreement is on both sides of Santa Maria, on the west as well as on the east. The annexation efforts that will come forward through this effort means we will amend that Greenbelt Agreement, but it's not absolute. You as a city council, the county of Santa Barbara and LAFCO have the right and the ability to amend that agreement. Uh, so the opportunities for growth, both east or west, or just east, if that is the case, um, will amend that Greenbelt Agreement, and that will hold the line for the next 30 years. Uh, I look forward to working with the staff and the, um, the decision makers, and I have one suggestion in this visioning document. I probably have read it six times, provided comments to the consultants and to the staff, and I read it fresh again uh, this weekend. And there is one confusing section in the document it's on page three, um, where it provides the existing uh, general plan policies and goals. I, I think that either needs to be deleted from the document because the whole document is forward thinking. Those, those policies were adopted 30 years ago or those policies need to have a date on it that says adopted in 1993, um, you know, uh, to be amended through this policy or through this process. Um, I, but I personally think it should be deleted because it, it's confusing when you read that and then you read the rest of the document. So um, I should have made that comment a long time ago, but it just occurred to me reading it fresh again. Everything else is, um, looks great, and I look forward to all of the other documents and efforts that we'll have as we move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I have another hand by Ken Huff. Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Ken Huff, uh, Santa Barbara County Action Network and uh, Mayor Patino and council members. Thank you for your service. 
Um, I just have an issue with I mean, the whole item that the staff has done, I think, really good work and the consultant. But on page two of the staff report, it says it will ultimately be necessary for the city to annex additional land east of 101 and or to the northwest of the city. And I, I think this is we're talking about a vision document. And I think it's quite early to be saying something that conclusory that it will ultimately be necessary for the city to annex. Instead, consider, while it may ultimately be necessary for the city to annex land to here or there, the city intends to, um, to avoid, uh, to the extent possible, um, annexing expansion into the prime ag lands around it, which, of course, the, the document before you makes a big... Um, it makes a lot of a lot of points about how agriculture is so important to this area, and so it is. And, and we should say that did the outreach to the residents that was talked about did it suggest did uh, potential areas for annexation? Because the report I just heard listening tonight sounded like that, but did people actually come to meetings and say, we need to annex? Questions for you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That was the last speaker, Madam Mayor. Thank you. So I, I did ask you for any correspondence, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, and there okay. was none. I'll bring this item back to the council for discussion and a motion. Madam Mayor, I would yes. like to uh, make a motion that the city council approve the draft vision, guiding principles, and areas of change and stability. I, I guess there's going to be no discussion. We no, can discuss no. after. After the second? After the first oh, and second. I'll, I'll yeah. second it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second, and now I'm going to ask for any discussion. Mr. I, yeah, I, I think that Mr. Huff brings up, uh, Kim brings up a, a, a good idea, a good point. You, you alluded to the same thing, Mayor, and uh, um, I, th I think we're, we're making these assumptions and these decisions based on the standards we're living within today. <clears throat> and my effort a few minutes ago was to suggest that the people of the future will make them when it's 2045 and 2050. So, so uh, I, I agree that, and I think everyone would agree that we should do our best to protect the um, ag land, but uh, things will change. Other things will change that, that may cause all of us to, to, uh, to think differently um, when when society changes, the needs change, and if there's another way to increase the population without annexation, then I, I don't know how that would be. Where our city is, what I, I guess you might call it a a sprawling uh, community style. Uh, we we have chosen not to go up, so we don't have those large buildings that hold, you know, five and ten thousand people. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have the fear that 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 I think I uh, kind of got from from uh, Mr. from Ken. Uh, I I think that we should always be aware of it, but it's not happening in the very near future. And uh, I, I I don't I don't I, I think there's a lot of concern that these things might happen in the next couple of years, and that's not the case. Again, Mr. Stillwell. If I might clarify, because um, I think the council is raising important issues. Um, the step tonight is to focus on whether the vision, it, whether you, how did I write it down? Whether you're inspired by the vision or at least think it's the Santa Maria you want to see. And so the vision statement itself doesn't talk about annexation or not annexing. Of course, if the council would wants to amend the vision statement to include that, you could. But it does. I include things uh, such as um, 
proud her heritage and history, um, pr the recognizing uh, the strong foundation in the agricultural industry. So, uh, you know, future councils can take that as preserve our agricultural don't annex or preserve it and, and uh, be considered about it. And then with the guiding principles, um, there, uh, the first one is agricultural identity. And again, that provides some flexibility to future councils, but does highlight that this council in creating the vision and guiding principles for the general plan for the future decades prioritizes the ag identity as an important principle for the city of Santa Maria. And, you know, I think what Mr. Huff is trying to say, and, and I would concur, is that um, those are open spaces. That that farmland is really important because it um, it sort of makes Santa Maria who we are. And they're open and they're green and they're beautiful and the smell of strawberries. And it, yeah, we we don't really like things to change real well. But like you said, we're we're not going to be the decision makers on that. So it, and I understand that. I, I I have people saying, "Gee, I wish Santa Maria was back like it was in the in the fifties." And um, we all are sitting here because we, we love our city and we love the way it is right now. And we know, we, we know it's going to change. Madam Mayor? Yeah, um, that yes. would be my, my, my comment would be, you know, we're focusing more on the, how we would like to see Santa Maria, kind of like the vision. Mm -hmm. And definitely, I think it's going to be necessary that in this process, in this next phases, to address all these um, uh, concerns about the future, and I think it's a, as much as, have as much uh, input as possible on this, because that's, that's our future. That's a, I mean, I, I, ambish, I, I see my kids uh, playing those future parks, uh, living in those future apartments, houses, so it's, this is huge, this is huge, and, and it's not gonna be also the rule for in the future, as you say. We might approve it, but maybe the city council members in the few, in 50 years will say, you know, maybe they'll exchange it to another thing. So um, it's a process. So I think that the next uh, phases are going to be really interesting to hear the input from everybody and find a common ground. Thank you. Ms. Soto. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you know, I, I keep saying over and over how exciting it is that we're, we're updating our general plan. And, um, and to me, what's been, what I've come to learn as, as a councilwoman has been how a lot, all the development and the growth that we've seen in recent years in the city of Santa Maria is really due to the general plan that was put in place, like, in the 90s, right? And so um, it is important to acknowledge that every step of the way will have a direct impact on future generations. And I think what's most important here, as I've said earlier this evening, is making sure that we continue to hear from residents um, and, and really hear um, what their vision for our community is as, as we continue to move forward with this process. Um, in terms of, um, you know, how we're going to grow, whether it's through annexation or growing up, uh, growing and building up, <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely um, an, an important conversation, but also I think what's most important is having the conversation about like, you know, at what point do we say, like, we've grown enough because we also, you know, we have ample, ample room to grow, you know, um, on the east and, 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 and west side. And so um, I think that those are, are all very important um, things for us to keep in mind, but also know that really the folks who are driving this process will continue to be um, the com community members and residents. And so, um, keeping that in mind, but um, I, I know that we've addressed this question just with what the mayor asked and what council member Cordero asked about um, an extension, but this is just, this. it doesn't necessarily mean that this will be um, the ultimate result, right, of the general plan update, correct? That, that's correct. That's why I um, wanted to mention that the 
the if the council adopts the recommended principles, guiding principles, and the vision statement tonight, it doesn't tie down mm -hmm. annexation or not annexing as, as the path forward. It provides those options still for the council to consider in future phases. Go ahead, Thank, Ms. thank you, um, Madam Mayor. I, I also just, I did want to mention, so this, this document is still in a draft form, and so um, both Ms. Tamura and Mr. Huff brought up some points of potential edits in the document. And one of them I wanted to mention is on page 13 where it discusses annexation and expansion. Mm -hmm. And right now it does say as the population and economy grow, it will ultimately be necessary. We could change that to may. It may be necessary because it hasn't been really determined yet. So we could make that change. And then also Ms. Tamara brought up a point about adding some dates to um, that other section of the document that talks about our existing general plan. And if your council would like to do that, we could also include some dates in there to make it more clear that when the, those existing general plan policies were approved. That would be great. Thank you. Madam Mayor, yes. would you be able to um, uh, talk, share what those dates, you, what those dates, I had to step out. <laughs> really. Um, yeah, 1988 to 1993. Right. Yeah. yeah. By hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we can go look and confirm exactly what those dates are and just add them in for clarification. That, that would be great. It would give us a point of reference. You know, I, I think back about the councils before us who, who bought water, state water. That was really controversial. And that was really a, a great determination of how much we could grow. And I think that um, councils that go after us are gonna have to just make that decision, and I've said this before, how much do we actually want to grow? And that's gonna be a decision for other people out there. Um, because I, I think Mr. Huff makes a, 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 a good point when, when he said, you know, Annexation means like, you know, the gates are open, we can grow as much as we want to. But that's a decision that we won't, you know, we certainly won't be making. Maybe some of you will still be on the council, but councils after us will have to make how that decision, how much do we really want to grow in Santa Maria? Thank you. Any other comments, questions, comments, anything? Okay. Okay, so we've had the motion in a second, and we've had our discussion. So I'll bring it back to the council for a motion. You, we already have one. Pardon? Oh. Um, we have one on the table. We have, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, a motion. <laughs> I mean, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? <laughs> uh, council Member Waterfield. Aye. Council Member Cordero. Aye. Council Member Soto. Aye. Council Member Escobedo. Aye. Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we will go back to item 4A, the CDBG allocations. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider the Block Grants Advisory Committee's recommendations for the allocation of fiscal year 2021-22 Community Development Block Grant funds. Consider allocating $37,500 to public service programs and consider staff's recommendation for the capital funds. Ms. Rojo, you will be making our presentation. Yes. And it's really sad not to see the CDBG Grants Committee out here in the audience, but. I'm, I'm sorry? <laughs> and you turned them away? They did show up? Oh, that's very sweet of them. Well, they'll be recognized tonight because they definitely do put in a lot of work oh, to yeah. um, have these recommendations come before you tonight. So good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. The item before you this evening is the annual public hearing to consider the fiscal year 2021-2022 recommendations by the Block Grants Advisory Committee for the allocation of federal community development block grants, better known as CDBG. Okay, there we go. Tonight we will be asking for the following. 
to conduct a public hearing to receive comments from the public, consider staff's recommendations for capital funds, consider the Block Grants Advisory Committee's recommendations for public services, and allocate your individual $7,500 to public service programs. A little bit about CDBG. CDBG is a program administered by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, better known as HUD. It was created over 45 years ago and provides local governments with grant funds to address a variety of needs in the community. CDBG is probably the only federal grant program that allows local discretion as how to, the funds may be used to best meet the needs of the community. The main requirement is that the city's activities and projects comply with federal regulations and meet one of three national objectives, in particular, primary benefit to low to moderate income persons. Nearly two-thirds of the city of Santa Maria's population falls under that category, which means the majority of the city benefits from these CDBG dollars. The recommendations before you tonight are ones that our Block Grants Advisory Committee voted on following application reviews and site visits. And speaking of our committee, I would like to thank our committee members for their time and hard work. They are all volunteers who spend countless hours reading over every single application, attending site visits, writing reports, and deliberating on these proposed allocations. The City of Santa Maria will receive one more, a little more than $1.6 million this upcoming fiscal year. It is about $21,000 less than last year, however. Of this amount, 20%, or a little over $321,000, will be available for general administration. 15%, uh, or a little over $241,000, will be available for public services, and the remaining 65% or approximately $1,044,000 will be available for capital projects. Plus, there's an additional $75,000 for capital. This money comes from unused funds that, uh, whose projects have been closed out. As part of the CDBG funding process, we conducted a virtual community needs workshop on August 3rd, 2020 to receive comments from the public and discuss the needs and priorities in the community. There were 21 participants present at the needs workshop, many of whom spoke before the committee. They provided feedback on the increased need to fund programs and projects that assist the homeless, youth, seniors, farm workers, and those who suffer from abuse and or trauma, Res residents who may not have access to technology and public art. An increase in food and shelter, particularly affordable housing, was also an issue brought up by several speakers. In January, a month after CDBG applications were due, the committee broke up into five teams and conducted virtual site visits and in-depth review of each application. Following the site visits, each team prepared written reports and shared them with the rest of the committee. The deliberations process was divided into two separate virtual meetings. The first took place on February 8th and allowed applicants to go before the committee to answer any additional questions related to their applications. The second part of the deliberations process took place February 18th. During this virtual session, the public could observe but not participate. Committee members took surveys to rank the public services applications and discussed the allocations based on the collective results. The recommendations before you tonight are the results of that discussion. They are listed in attachment F in order of the Block Grants Advisory Committee ranking. The committee collectively decided it would not make recommendations related to the upcoming year's capital funding as it felt the City Council had already done that during the October 6, 2020 City Council meeting. This is the meeting in which the City Council reviewed the capital project proposals. In turn, staff will be making some slight recommendations tonight based on a few changes that took place since that meeting. An additional piece of information to share with you tonight that may assist you in making additional decisions for both public services and capital funding. Last month, the Special Projects Division conducted an online needs assessment survey to get a better idea of any impacts the pandemic has had on the community's needs. The survey was available electronically for three weeks. This information was analyzed by our division and was also compared with the online needs assessment survey that was completed by the public in August of 2019. 
we received 134 responses. 90% of those responses came from personal opinion. This slide shows a comparison between the 2019 and 2021 surveys. The sample size was also about the same with us receiving a few more responses than two years ago. A focus group made up of service providers from a variety of nonprofit groups throughout the community was also created to obtain additional information about how the pandemic has impacted the needs of the city's residents. Two dozen service providers attended the March 16th virtual meeting. Some of the changes they believe stem from the pandemic include increased level of housing and security, increased number of domestic violence incidents, increased need for sexual assault and crisis response services, increased level of depression amongst school-aged children, and increased demand for more recreation and community enrichment activities. Several service providers also mentioned the increased need for critical services such as food and medicine, as well as more assistance to those experiencing homelessness. This is in line with what the service providers shared during the August 2020 Virtual Community Needs Assessment Workshop. So we also asked questions about how the pandemic has affected participants, if, uh, uh, participants, and we asked if they have received assistance as a result of the pandemic. This gives us a better idea of who, of who we are hearing from. As you can tell from the slide, 20% said they have received some sort of assistance as a result of the pandemic. We also asked how the pandemic has affected them. The largest group, bless you, the largest group falls under the kids in virtual learning. Over a third of those who responded have children in virtual learning. Also, we noticed there was almost 20% had an issue with childcare and about the same had trouble paying their rent or their mortgage. About 17% said their hours had been reduced because of COVID. As far as the meat and potatoes of the survey, we asked the same 32 questions that were asked in 2019. These questions include topics that cover 10 different categories, usually funded with CDBG. Participants were asked to rank each activity in order of priority. There are several interesting findings that have resulted from the 2021 survey when compared to the 2019 survey. For the sake of time, I'll hit on a couple of them. For the most part, the priorities for these 10 categories have not changed drastically in the, la in the past two years. Three out of the top five priorities continue to receive the greatest number of votes for, quote, highest priority. The top two priorities continue to be mental health and at-risk youth. Critical needs fell from being ranked the third highest in 2019 to being ranked the fifth, while seniors and elderly went from being ranked fourth in 2019 to being ranked third. It is important to note that in both of these surveys, questions related to food and medication programs were not asked. Those are considered an automatic high priority and therefore are not included as part of the survey questions. The questions under the critical needs category are more in line with services related to substance abuse, legal services, services for abused and neglected children, and services for battered and abused spouses. When we broke down the 10 categories and looked at the individual questions, we found that some of the activities within a category were reflected very differently. Take, for example, housing-related needs. As a whole, it ranked low. But as you can see, rental assistance for tenants is an activity that jumped from being a medium priority to a high priority from 2019 to 2021. It actually saw a 20% increase. We feel this shift may be related to the pandemic and growing need for emergency rent assistance as many have, faced, have been faced with a job loss, a reduction in income, and growing debt. As you can see from those who took the survey, nearly a fifth of those who took the survey were financially affected by COVID and or have had trouble paying their rent. Another interesting piece of information is what dropped in priority from 2019 to 2021. Even though the survey reflects a drop in priority for security deposits, for example, the city has seen an increase in the number of security deposits that people have requested. It went from 80 in 2019 to 97 in 2020. 
Legal services are also an interesting one. During the focus group discussion with service providers on March 16th, Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County shared that the organization has seen an increase in the need for legal assistance as a result of the pandemic. We hope this brief overview of the survey results are helpful and informative. Staff plans on conducting another survey post-pandemic to gather additional data that will allow us to capture more information that may be helpful in how we allocate future CDBG funding. So with that, let us get right into the capital funding portion, and then I'll move into the public service. All but one of the agencies that submitted an initial proposal followed through with app applying, bringing the total number of applications from seven to six. In addition, when the applications were submitted, the actual allocation amount from HUD had not been released. So applicants asked for, for funding based on the estimate, not what the actual amount was that we received from HUD. And as I mentioned earlier, we did receive a slight decrease in our allocation amount. Taking into consideration this change, staff recommends that all but two of the applicants receive the recommended allocations proposed by the City Council back in October. For the two applicants set aside, staff recommends that additional funding be provided. These two projects are the Public Works Department's ADA Pedestrian Safety and Accessibility Improvement Project and the City of Santa Maria's Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Program. Here is why we're making these recommendations. During the October 6th City Council meeting, the City Council expressed an interest in providing additional funding to ADA public improvement projects if additional funding became available. And as far as the TBRA, uh, allocation is concerned, slightly increasing the amount of TBRA administration from the originally asked $10,000 amount to $15,000 will allow the city to financially recover additional expenses associated with in this increasingly popular program. As I mentioned, we've seen an uptick in the number of applications that our division has received as far as tenant-based rental assistance program. Now, we do receive the TBRA program is funded by the HOME program, and it comes from the, the county. The county is the lead entity, and we're part of the consortium that, uh, that receives the, the funding. However, because we're not a direct recipient of HOME funding, the county is, we don't receive any additional money for the administration of the program. The only money we're able to, the, the money that we receive, we're able to use for direct assistance, but we're not able to actually cover the administrative cost of managing and executing the program. That's where the CDBG funding comes in to pick up that amount. So moving on, here you can see a very colorful pie, pie chart. The bulk of the capital funding, which is approximately 83%, is proposed to go towards three city projects. The ADA work meets the priority one, um, which is critical need. And, the, uh, and providing ADA compliance and the public improvements. Um, and it also falls under uh, priority four, which is the public improvements priority. Approximately 9% of the capital funding is recommended to assist those experiencing homelessness. And about 8% of the capital funds will go towards the maintenance of affordable housing. This includes Capslow's Minor Home Repair Program, and that's a program that allows people to continue to live more comfortably in their homes by providing handyman services and structural repairs. It also includes funding for the administration of our TBRA program. So now moving on to public services. Regarding public services, the Block Grants Advisory Committee focused on those programs and projects that prevent homelessness, address basic human necessities, meet critical emergency needs, assist the elderly, and expand services for at-risk youth. 12 of the 19 public service applicants are recommended for funding. Seven of those applicants, or 58%, will assist residents with critical need services such as food, medicine, legal services, and support services for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. Two of those applicants, about 17%, will assist the elderly, and two others, 17%, will assist the homeless population. One agency, which is 8%, will assist the homeless youth. And here's a breakdown of, of the allocations that are being recommended by the Block Grants Advisory Committee. 
Now they are ranked in, they are being displayed in order of ranking. So what the committee did was during the second part of the deliberations, they did a survey monkey and they all submitted their the ranking and then we gathered all that information and then they, based on the cumulative, the collective results, that's how they started discussing the agencies and, and how they came up with the allocations. So, as I mentioned, 12 are being recommended for funding, seven are not being recommended for funding. You can see here on your screen the seven that are not being recommended for funding. It really came down to supply and demand. It's just more demand than there is supply. And with CDBG having a 15% public service cap that only left $241,000, and then you subtract the 37, 1,500 set aside for the committee. Um, it, the committee only had a little over 200,000 to be able to allocate on that February 18th night. So here's what's next. Each council member has $7,500 to add to an existing public service grant allocation. The $7,500 can also be split between more than one agency or combined with another council member, $7,500, to fund an organization not being recommended for funding to meet the $15,000 minimum. Please keep in mind the maximum for any agency is $24,000. At this time, we will open the discussion on the recommendations before you tonight for capital and public services funding. Once the discussion is complete and public comment is heard, we ask that council members make their specific allocations for the public services category and approve both the final recommendations for capital and public services funding. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I've got lots. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Ms. Rojo. That was, oh, that was a great report. Thank Before you. I forget, could I get a copy of the survey? Uh, oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, questions from the council? You want to start? Mr. Escobedo? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So first, I, I, I know how difficult it can be uh, with so many great organizations that, not enough money. Uh, that's a huge task. So thank you for thank you for everybody who was part of the process. Thank you for all the uh, members of the committee. I, I think it's um, it's tough. So and I have been into that place as uh, for the fit uh, district representing and in the human services commission, and we had something like this going on a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, we're going to be presenting our 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 thing uh, at the end of this month. So one of my questions is, uh, I would like to know why there was, why do we say no, or what it was not uh, recommended to, uh, was the criteria to not uh, funding those uh, seven, uh, seven organizations? Sure. Thank you, Council Member Escobedo. That's a great question. So there's a variety of things that the committee takes into consideration when it decides who gets what and how much and, and what the recommendations are going to go before the committee, I mean, before the city council. Um, and so you, there's always a needs assessment that is conducted at the beginning of the funding process, and that usually takes place in August. And so that sets and that comes to the city council, and the priorities are adopted for that fiscal year. And that kind of is definitely a big tool because that is your barometer, your, your kind of template of what what you're going to fund. So that's one way. Um, two, they review every single application and I, I have a binder that will show you. Um, so here are all the applications. And this isn't everything. You guys all used to get one. Now we do things electronically. Um, but um, so they review every single application. Then we also do a staff analysis and we provide that to them. And that goes more into the management side of it. So we, they also take into consideration, does the agency have the capacity to manage the funding? Does the agency, is, how has the agency done in the last several years as far as managing the funding? Um, 
are they submitting their reports on time? Are we having, because that's, that's a big thing, that's one of many requirements of HUD is we also have to make sure that the agency receiving the funding is capable of managing the funds because there's no such thing as free money and CDBG is definitely not free money. <laughs> um, it is a federal program after all and there's a lot of requirements and, and um, so that's another thing they take into consideration. They also take into consideration um, you know, can the agency still sustain itself without this funding? Uh, is the agency trying to augment its, pro its, its services or is, is the agency trying to stay afloat? Because that's another thing that we have to look into. So, and then also, of course, council's recommendations are taken into consideration. Uh, and then they conduct site visits. So after the, the applications are submitted, usually in December, then, um, and then we provide our analysis of the agencies, then they go out and conduct site visits and ask further questions. And it's almost kind of, well, I always call it like a, like a first interview, so you submit your, your application, then you get, have go through your first interview process, and then they actually go through another, like a second round of interviews, and they do the deliberations, and that's in a public fashion, and even more questions are asked of them, and then also the agencies are able to clear up anything else. So by the time they're making these recommendations, they have had so much um, information about each agency and then also the needs of the community that they're able to make an assessment as to what the what the biggest priorities are as well as and what the needs are as well as what the capabilities are of these agencies to be able to manage the funding thank you sure did you have questions miss waterfield did you have any questions mr cordero i, I I don't think a question, but a discussion on okay, taking some we'll, observations, we'll but we'll I don't discuss. have any questions okay. right now. I have a, I have a question on, on the legal, uh, legal aid. What were the, because you said there were more um, legal assistance that was needed. What were some of the topics of, that increased that legal assistance? The biggest thing is, I, I believe, the eviction moratorium was a big one. Uh, I, there were still quite a few landlords that, uh, sorry, tenant, from what, from what I gathered, um, there's still a lot of misinformation and lack of information as far as uh, tenant landlord rights and what the eviction moratorium m meant and what it does and does not um, okay. cover. So uh, I, I think there was a lot of, um, there was a, a misconception, for example, that you know, it, it, the eviction moratorium protects you no matter what, and it, it, that's not necessarily the case. The tenant also has to show that he or she yeah. is doing everything he or she can to make the rent, and there needs to be documentation. So there was a lot of education more than anything. And then also on, they were also trying to educate landlords on what he or she could and couldn't do. So there was a lot of education. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Madam Clerk, um, I'd like to open up the public hearing. Do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? Yes, Madam Mayor. We do have um, some written court communications that were received from Patricia Solorio. She wrote requesting that the City Council keep nonprofits at the top of the list when allocating funding. Brian Hollander submitted his comments on behalf of Independent Living Resources Center. Jennifer Smith wrote requesting approval of the proposed allocation for the Legal Foundation. And uh, we have a few hands raised in our um, okay. Zoom meeting. We'll start with um, Alexa Martin, if she's available to talk. Thank you for the opportunity to make a comment tonight. My name is Alexa Martin and I am the program manager with the Independent Living Resource Center. For those of you who are not familiar with us, ILRC is the only cross-disability peer-run organization in Santa Barbara County. We have been providing services to any person with any disability of all ages and income levels for the past 45 years. Our mission is to promote independent living and full access for people with disabilities through advocacy, education, and action in our communities. Benefits assistance, information and referral, advocacy, personal assistance, assistive technology, emergency preparedness, 
housing, and services and support specific to the deaf community are just a few of the many services we provide that enable our consumers to live more independent lives and continue as or become active members within their communities. Additionally, we have worked hard to ensure our consumers' needs were met as a result of this pandemic, including access to food, addressing the digital divide, and ensuring our consumers continue to have access to the services and supports they rely on. I wanna thank you for your many years of support for ILRC. We understand that the grant committee has a very challenging job with many worthy applicants and these decisions are not made lightly. While we did not make the cut for recommendation this year, we know this was not due to a lack of wanting to support our agency, but because there truly wasn't enough funding to go around, especially as a result of the pandemic. Local support is critical to ILRC's success and ability to continue providing services each year. It allows us to leverage funds for our state and federal grant matching support requirements and shows that the city of Santa Maria supports their residents with disabilities. Without funding, we may have to reduce staff hours, which would result in lengthy wait lists for consumers to receive services. I wanna mention that we are careful, diligent stewards of these funds and ensure that all reporting and grant requirements are always met. I am here tonight to encourage the city council members to use your discretionary funds to support ILRC so we can continue the great work we do in Santa Maria community. Thank you for your consideration. Patricia Keeling. Yes, uh, my name is Sean Kelly Zorn. I live in Orchid. And uh, I want to make some comments on this uh, service block. I'm a senior living independently in Orchid, uh, California, and I am a retired. 25-year Cal EMA Hazmat Outreach instructor and an active 15-year CERT member and instructor. In the last 12 months, has shown our social vulnerability and susceptibility to chaos rising from social unrest, weather anomalies, wildfires, and pandemics, and other things. The people who are most vulnerable to these events are our senior citizens and handicapped individuals. <clears throat> Supporting uh, this public service project allocation would be a great service for these people. Any way that we can support independent living for these people would provide great value not only to these people, it would also provide benefits to all of our citizens and institutions by reducing negative impacts on other people who have to support these people. As a trained and experienced emergency responder, I recommend and urge the city of Santa Maria council members to support this much needed uh, action and uh, especially directed at seniors and that type of support. Thank you. Pardon me, Madam Mayor, I could not yes. understand which one he was referring to. I think he was talking about That's independent living. Mm -hmm. What was it? Independent living. Independent living. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Patricia Keeling, okay. followed by Edwin Weaver. Patricia Keeling, <laughs> followed by Edwin Weaver. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Pat Keelan. I'm CEO for Communify, uh, formerly the Community Action Commission of Santa Barbara County. Communify Senior Nutrition Program is the longest serving meal delivery program in the region, providing free daily meals to seniors. Currently, we're serving uh, nearly 275 senior residents every day in Santa Maria alone. The average senior lives at or below the poverty line, is female, living alone, and over the age of 75. Since the pandemic began, demand for home-delivered meals has more than doubled. Uh, community meal sites in Santa Maria have been closed since the, the pandemic began, so all of our meals are now being delivered directly to seniors' homes, following strict safety protocol 
um, utilization of PPE and uh, no face-to-face -face contact with seniors. Now more than ever, providing those hot, nutritious meals to our seniors on a daily basis is critical to helping to keep our seniors safe, independent, and healthy at home. In addition to daily meals, we also provide frozen meals for weekends to those seniors who are homebound, as well as provide nutrition education to help seniors make healthier food choices. We are also in the process of planning to implement friendship calls using volunteers to reduce their sense of isolation um, that so many of our seniors are experiencing during this prolonged pandemic. Of course, delivering all meals individually to, to seniors at home has meant that our costs have increased significantly. We've hired more delivery drivers and secured additional vehicles, brought on um, volunteers, um, all of which has increased our gas and, and maintenance expenses. In addition, uh, rising food costs have resulted in a 25% increase in our cost per meal. These challenges, however, have not deterred us from our mission of feeding se uh, seniors. In fact, we've added over 100 new Santa Maria senior residents to our program since January 1st, and we continue to add new seniors every week. I truly appreciate all of the hard work that your staff and the CDBG Grant Committee has committed to this year's grant review process. Unfortunately, as you know, we were not recommended for funding this year. In the past, Communify has been able to absorb the increasing gap in funding that this program requires. I think I've mentioned in previous uh, City Council meetings that we, uh, we must uh, fundraise approximately 55 to 60% of the funds needed to operate this program every year. But moving into the future, we will no longer be able to do this. We face some very difficult decisions ahead. Now more than ever, we are asking for your support to ensure our seniors continue to receive hot, nutritious meals to make health and, and remain safe at home. Thank you so much for your consideration this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, Mr. Weaver, followed by Kirsten Cahoon. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Edwin Weaver. I'm the Executive Director of Fighting Back Santa Maria Valley. I want to thank uh, the Mayor and the City Council for tonight's deliberations. Um, I'm here to talk to you about our uh, homeless outreach program that we've started over the last two years that specifically targets homeless uh, teenagers and young adults, so anyone 16 to 24 years old. We've partnered with the City for Project Safe Place, which has been successful up until COVID, and then we had to pause it for a little bit. But we also have done successful uh, street outreach to our transitional age youth, and we're able to house 75% uh, of those that we came in contact with over the year, last year. Uh, and so we're really proud of the work that we've been doing. This has all been supported through the heat funds that we were awarded, but those funds run out at the end of June. And so we're uh, really hoping that tonight that you will increase the allocation from 15,000 uh, up to uh, 20,000, which is what we budgeted for this next uh, fiscal year. We know there's a lot of other great organizations that also need funds, but we do believe that our homeless young adults are most vulnerable and we are the only uh, group out there working with this population. And so we really could use your CDBG funds this year. So thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Weaver. Uh, Kirsten Calhoun followed by Lauren Otterbach. Lauren? Hi, I'm Hi. here. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Lauren Utterback, and I am the Emergency Preparedness Services Manager at the Independent Living Resource Center. Uh, I greatly appreciate the Council and the City of Santa Maria for the opportunity to speak with you today and the ongoing support that you have provided to ILRC. In our Santa Maria office, we have provided PPE to consumers <laughs> personalized disaster and emergency planning, nutrition services coordination, 
and I personally have provided uh, 1,410 services to people with disabilities in Santa Maria since August of 2020. We have also provided all of the things that my program manager, Alexa Martin, has mentioned, such as assistive technology, uh, which could be walkers or wheelchairs for those who are extremely low income who we serve. Uh, we provide advocacy, uh, housing application assistance, employment assistance, COVID-19 related assistance, transportation, and in-language support. We have delivered 173 bags of PPE to Meals on Wheels Santa Maria clients and their volunteers. Uh, ILRC has provided Santa Maria residents uh, with disabilities with assistance with COVID vaccine appointment scheduling, transportation to COVID vaccine appointments for people with wheelchairs and mobility disabilities so that they can arrive and leave their appointments safely when no one else could transport them. Uh, we have also provided transportation for COVID positive people with disabilities from the hospital to their home when no one else could drive them so that they would be able to return to their home safely. Some of the individuals I serve have asked me to share their success stories and comments about ILRC and the services that we've provided for them. Uh, one such anonymous consumer said, I'd like to thank you very much for the PPE and backup battery the ILRC provided for me and my family. You and your awesome disability disaster access and resources program has provided me with much needed peace of mind during precarious times. For that, I'm very humbled and grateful. Thank you. Prior to contacting ILRC, I was, generally, I was genuinely concerned about what I would do if the power ever went out at my home. However, it wasn't until recently that it was announced that there were gonna be scheduled rolling blackouts and that my concerns significantly escalated. I've been a CPAP user since 2010 after, after suffering viral congestive heart failure. My life literally relies upon its use while I sleep. I began research researching options and price various systems, but ultimately couldn't afford them or concluded they weren't feasible for my home. The backup battery, also a power inverter that ILRC provided me, allows me to power my CPAP. It can also charge important electronics uh, that I would need during a disaster or an emergency. I've incorporated my new backup battery into my family's disaster preparedness planning, and I feel confident we would persevere through the most through most short-term events. U.S. Air Force with a service-connected disability and also medically retired law enforcement officer of more than 30 years. I live on a monthly fixed income, which makes large purchases difficult. The ILRC has restored a previously lost sense of security to my daily living. I'm, genu I'm genuinely humbled. Lauren's patience, compassion, and smooth facilitation through the entire process has been a godsend. I'm forever grateful and thankful. Uh, one of our other, one of my other consumers is someone who spoke previously, Sean Kelly Thorne, uh, who also received a backup battery from us for one of his um, electronic uh, durable medical equipment needs. Thank, thank you, Ms. Arbach. Your your time is up. We'll have to go on to another speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kirsten Calhoun will try you again, followed by Stephen Delira. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Go oh, ahead. Wonderful. <laughs> Hi, the, Madam Mayor, City Council. This is Kirsten Cahoon, Director of Homeless Services for the Good Samaritan Shelter. I just wanted to first thank and acknowledge the CDBG Block Grants Committee volunteers who had such a tough job this year and every year, but just do an incredible process um, in making sure that all of the nonprofits are heard and that the process is fair. And we just really, as a nonprofit, appreciate um, everything that they do. We also just wanna thank um, the city council and everyone involved for their continued support of Good Samaritan Shelter. We continue to serve the most vulnerable homeless in our community. We are amongst some incredible nonprofits asking for funding, and we know that we can't do the work that we do without our partner agencies that are listed and we're asking for funding this evening. So we are extremely grateful to be a part of the team that helps um, the vulnerable in our community. 
And we are hoping that you accept the recommendations. Um, Good Sam can't do the work that we do without the support from the city of Santa Maria. This past year has been very tough trying to keep the homeless safe um, with the pandemic and continuing all of our services. But Good Sam has not skipped a beat. We never closed our doors. We never stopped serving. We added programs and continued to serve the clients that needed us most. Even under strict public health guidelines and having to serve less clients, tonight there's over 100 clients in our Good Samaritan shelter on Morrison. Amongst those are veterans, there are children, there are seniors, and just truly the most vulnerable in our community. So thank you for your continued support, and we appreciate everything you do for us. Thank you. Um, Stephen Delira, and uh, while he doesn't have a hand up, Brian Hollander has been <laughs> previously. So Stephen, we, go ahead and talk if you're ready. Thank you, as I unmute. Good evening, I'm Steve Delaire, Deputy Executive Director for Family Service Agency in Santa Maria Valley Youth and Family Center. I'd first like to thank the city and city council members for their continued support of our agency. As an update, the new lighting and the trash enclosures have been completed. And I come to you tonight requesting funding. Last year, Santa Maria Valley Youth and Family Center did not receive funding for the Safe Child Program. And this year we recommended for full funding by our visiting CDBG grant committee members. However, we did not make the final cut. And as a result, we are not recommended for funding this year. As a result of the global pandemic, pandemic when the governor issued a stay at home order within 24 hours, of the closure of schools and businesses, Santa Maria Valley Youth and Family Center switched over to the telehealth and telecommunication model and continued providing services to people in Santa Maria. Our agency worked closely with community-based organizations, public and private sector, philanthropic groups, community members to meet the needs of the youth and families in Santa Maria. The collective impact was amazing. We worked with Latinx indigenous work groups to provide education services to the Latinx and indigenous community. The Housing for the Harvest program worked to address people with COVID-like symptoms, those that had positive COVID tests, those that were exposed with people that had COVID. We worked to educate and assist in quarantining and isolating families to help stop the spread of COVID-19 in Santa Maria. In this collaborative effort, Santa Maria Valley Youth and Family Center worked with Marion Medical Center, the Ag Commissioner's Office, the Ag Advisory Committee, MICOP, COS, Promotores, Farm Laborers Group, Public Health Department, and the Department of Social Services. In addition, Family Service Agencies worked with United Way to provide rental assistance by distributing checks to Santa Marians. The collective approach has been amazing and very humbling. It is true that we are stronger together in light of everyone's effort, however, the playing field is far from equitable for the youth and families served in Santa Maria. Adverse childhood experiences is trauma, trauma that experiences that has been experienced by children. These traumas include emotional, sexual, and substance abuse, domestic violence, homelessness, mental illness, divorce, physical and emotional neglect, poverty, discrimination, and poor housing. The pandemic has increased these adverse childhood experiences. I will submit that when the children return to school, they will not be returning the same way they left. In fact, none of us will be the same after ex experiencing this pandemic. We are requesting $20,000 in which we would be able to provide 67 clients with a total of 33 counseling sessions. If two or more um, will come together, we could reach the 20,000. If two of you are willing to come together, we could reach the 15,000 and serve a total of 50 unduplicated individuals for a total of 249 counseling sessions. The state program provides trauma-informed crisis counseling that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. The program serves youth and families struggling with mental health issues, living in poverty and in at-risk homelessness. Now more than ever, the youth of, of Youth and families of Santa Maria need your support to help mitigate and or address the impact of the pandemic. We know there will be a demand for counseling as our children return to school and our residents return to work. Thank you for your consideration of our request. Uh, thank you. Um, Brian Hollander, followed by our final um, speaker, Nicole Janikowski. My name is Brian Hollander, and I'm a program manager with Independent Living Resource Center. 
I'd like to begin by thanking the City Council and uh, the City of Santa Maria, as well as the Grant Making Committee, for your many years of ongoing support uh, that you've provided to ILRC. ILRC is the only cross disability nonprofit organization serving the citizens of Santa Maria. As you've heard from my colleagues, we provide a wide array of, a wide array of services to people with disabilities in Santa Maria, as well as throughout the Tri County region. The need for our services has only increased in the wake of the unprecedented challenges that we currently face. For example, in Santa Maria, the number of consumers we've served year over year increased from approximately 41 in 2018 and 2019 to approximately 90 in 2019 and 2020. That doesn't include what we've served from August of 2020 to the current time. The number of distinct services provided which are services provided to a single individual also increased during that period from approximately 200 in 2018, 2019 to approximately 320 in 2019 and 2020. In the past year, we've had 40 requests for assistive technology equipment or assistance, 20 requests for personal assistance services, 36 requests for advocacy services, 278 requests for assistance with housing, which can include assistance with avoiding evictions or tenant protections. We've also had 478 requests for other independent living skills trainings in Santa Maria alone. These are just a few of the areas of service requests that we've received and filled during this period. And the support we've received from you has allowed us to fulfill these requests by maintaining our two full-time staff members and our office in Santa Maria. We appreciate the chance to share with you some of the impact that we've had together on the Santa Maria community, as well as appreciating any funding consideration that we receive. I'd like to once again, thank the uh, council and the committee and uh, have a nice evening. Hello, thank, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Nicole Janikowski. I work for the Independent Living Resources Center. I'm the Independent Living Advocate. Um, I want to take a few minutes to share about the services we provide and how much of an impact IRLC has made for the community. Um, I will start off by sharing our core services we provide. In the Santa Maria office, I have assisted consumers with their housing needs, provided assistive technology equipment, PPE, independent living skills, such as employment readiness and money management, advocacy, peer support, benefits assistance, and assisting consumers with setting up vaccine appointments. The people with disabilities are the most affected by the pandemic, and we have been bridging the gap to ensure they have access to the services and supports they need. Um, and been addressing the digital divide by making sure our consumers have access to computers. Um, I want to take a few minutes to highlight, I mean, a minute or so to highlight a couple of the supports I have provided in the Santa Maria residents. Um, I have been working with a consumer who was unable to leave her home due to mobility, mobility issues and lack of assistive technology. We were able to provide her with a power wheelchair, which allowed her to leave her home and begin participating in her community again. This individual has also been impacted by the digital divide due to the pandemic, and we are able to provide her with a Chromebook to aid in her housing search, allow her to accept services and support more efficiently and to connect with her family and friends. She later expressed to me how thankful she was for IRLC and how blessed she feels to be able to go to the grocery store and to go outside to get some fresh air with her new power chair. A second consumer I would like to share about heard about us through our commercial airing on local channels. His wife passed away in January due to the coronavirus, and he stated he felt hopeless, lonely, and afraid because he can no longer afford his rent. I provided him with peer support and worked with him to navigate the various bar barriers he was facing as a result of her death. My consumer has since expressed how much more at ease he feels and now has sent a sense of hope. He called me just to tell me that I motivated him to start packing his wife's stuff and that has been just sitting around as he was depressed. 
We later applied for COVID rental assistance to allow him to stay in his home while we figured out a long-term housing solution. Many of our staff at IRLC have disabilities, which allows us to provide our consumers with the compassion and understanding that they deserve. The support of the City of San Marie is crucial in allowing us to continue providing these important services. I encourage you to use any funds available to support the great work that Independent Living Resource Center does. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was our last speaker, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, I would uh, I'd like to close the public hearing and bring this back to the Council for the consideration of staff's recommendation and determination of our allocation of 37500 So let's begin with public service. Is it just the motion? I, no, I no. guess I will go. We're just discussing, right? Is it what we're talking about? Sure. Um, my gosh, this is probably one of the hardest decisions that we make as a council because we look at oh, yes, of course. we look at you know all of these great organizations that um, need our money and depend on our money, and you you throw COVID on top of everything, and everybody's affected. The children, the elderly, the in-between, everybody is just so affected by all of this. And um, it's really hard to choose. And I, I'm down to three. <laughs> okay, now, are you, are you talking about the public service? We're, yeah, the, that's we're doing what public we're talking service. about, right? The public service recommendation allocations? Is that what we're talking about? Adopt, adopting the recommendations that right. CDGB already put in place, right. not so much what no, our We're our not allocations. talking about ours right now. We're talking okay. about public service right now. Oh, oh, are we are we wanting a motion? Is that what we're wanting, or and then discussion? <clears throat> if you want so, to. You know, the thought was, and as uh, Ms. Rojo presented it, was uh, as a foundation. If you were okay with the recommended allocations to public service, then you can adopt a motion to reflect that or, or, or whatever you would like. And that's then a basis and a foundation for you then to make your additional allocations of your 7,500 each. Okay, okay so in, in that, um, in this motion, we have four parts to it. And so I can, I can go ahead, and it does have the 37,500 in there, so I can go ahead and uh, make that motion yeah, at this point, no. um, if you leave the 37.5 out, then we would be able to see which ones aren't funded, and then the council can deliberate which other ones should be funded. Okay, so. And also, sorry, and also if, uh, if some of the ones are already funded, the, those can be modified in this second part of it. Okay. Okay, so then I'm looking at the recommendation, and we leave item number three out for right now. Because that's the allocate, to allocate 37,000 to public service programs. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So my motion is that city council um, approve a motion with these three items. One, conduct a public hearing to review comments from the public. We've done that. Consider the block grant advisory committee's uh, BGAC recommendation for the allocation of the fiscal year 20. 21 to 22 Community Development Block Grant CDBG Program Public Services Funds and consider staff's recommendation for the allocation of fiscal year 2021 to 22 Community Development Block Grant CDBG Program Capital Funds. Well, we're, well, we're talking about public service. Yeah. Right? First, uh, okay, leave out the capital, leave out the last leave one. Leave out the capital. Leave out number four. And leave out the 37,000. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I second. I make that motion. <laughs> I second. You second. Okay. We have a, a motion and a second to uh, take the recommendation of the public service of the CDBG Grants Committee. Any discussion? This, yes. This doesn't okay. prevent, by accepting this, this doesn't prevent someone from saying, I want to add to. Correct. X. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. All right. I wanted to make sure that, that was it's, the case. it's, it's, <laughs> we're not 
turning things around and switching around. We're just taking that. Okay, I, I, I get it. Okay, I, I'm with you it. got it. Okay. Further discussion? Um, none? Madam Clark, can you please call the roll? Council Member Waterfield? Council Member Escobedo? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Okay, now we're going to take the capital projects. Madam Mayor, i like yes. to make a motion to accept staff's recommendation or CDPG committee's recommendation okay. on the capital projects. Second. second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to accept the, um, the recommendation from CDBG on the capital projects. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Council Member Soto? Aye. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Council Member Escobedo? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. <laughs> okay. Now the fighting starts. No. <laughs> well, uh, Ms. Jessica, uh, congratulations. I, it's, it's been a long time since a newcomer onto the city council hasn't tried to switch things around, right, Ms. Romo? <laughs> 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 okay. Now our allocations. So um, how do you want to do this? You've got $7,500. Okay, I started with my allocation of the <laughs> n item number 10. 15 or 16. Those are the three that I've. Which ones? 10, 15, or 16. I would like to put my 7,500 with ILRC, which is which, which grant 15. 15. Mm -hmm. 15. Okay. Uh, mine, uh, I would like to choose the 18. Should it be like different or just? 18, um, nine, yes, ma or 10. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I, I, I don't know what, I don't know what you, are you, you're trying to you split to up? Split oh no, it, no, it was like. Uh, you're trying to decide between them? Yes, so, but if I have to choose, would it have to be choosing one? You cho choose one. Oh, okay, okay. But, it, but just to yeah. clarify, it needs to be a, that grant, he needs to receive a minimum of, of 15000 right. Yeah. Correct. So in that case, uh, I, what I heard, after what I saw in the presentation, and, and I, I see that there is a big concern in regards to uh, housing. Um, I think it's a, it, it went from medium to high priority. So I would like to invite one of my fellow uh, city council members to uh, to allocate uh, the $7,500 and together found uh, people's help, uh, self help housing. That's number 18. 18. 18. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I, um, I, as all of the other council uh, members, I'm leaning with two. Uh, one, number 10, and the other uh, is uh, number 16. Um, I was here, of course, as you were last year, and uh, number 16, um, Steve didn't get funded at all, mm -hmm. and then ended up getting some funds uh, later on, and then there was some extra funds came in, as I recall, and then he got funded for the Family Care Center. Uh, Last year, they were not recommended for public service funding, no. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, I, I am uh, I'm, uh, strongly considering uh, uh, Communify and the Senior Nutrition Program. And my reason is um, you just got to feed people. And these are certainly uh, two groups, number 10 and number uh, 16 are two of our, our most uh, uh, vulnerable demographic in any community. One is the, the, uh, the senior citizens and, of course, the young children. So uh, I've got no problem with, with, uh, with partnering with anyone on those two. But uh, somebody mentioned uh, Communify earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I would choose to put my money in Communify <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Ms. Waterfield and that gives them the 15000 is that correct? It, it does, and so I have a decision to make. 
because yeah. I'm like, are you putting it on? I know it. No, and and that that was my my number. That was my number one. Was was the number ten, and then the fifteen, and the and the sixteen, and then the fifteen. Yeah, it was 16, then 15. But I, I agree with you. The seniors are very vulnerable, Mr. Cadero. And, and, and um, I, I'm familiar with this organization yeah. in that not only is it the food that they get, that visit that yes. they get yes. from the person may also be the only other human contact that they exchange, that they get, even if it's from the front yard to the distance. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to their front door. So so there, it's, it's more than just somebody laying some food there. Uh, and I want to say again that uh, two years ago, uh, I had a person that I knew, the, the, the husband has now passed on. Uh, I called Communify, uh, then it was, of course, CDBG, I mean. Uh, CAC. Yeah. CAC. Yeah, CAC. And uh, I called him and I said, hey, I got a problem here with somebody that just got in touch with me and, and they're not getting any food. And the next day, this organization had food at their door. So um, okay. I, I'm, I'm all about supporting them. And, and uh, I, I wish we had more money. I guess it's time to give my... Uh, uh, Mayor Lavanino speech, and that is that this is one of the hardest things that we do, and there's there's always so many worthy organizations, and just never enough money to go around, and you're all to be, you must go home and cry. <laughs> uh, it's hard because these know, all are great, great and they they all deserve it, and, and it's so hard to say you're going to eat and you're not, uh, but. Uh, I will allocate my, my 75 to, uh, to communify uh, along with Ms. Waterfield and fund them. That would, <laughs> okay. if she yeah. does, if she commits. Did you, you got, what did you do? IMRC, Independent yes. Living Resource Center. Number 15. Okay. Yeah, number 15 in. I need an additional 75. Okay, and I'm going to do, um, Number 13, fighting back Santa Maria Valley, because they have been taking youth out of the riverbed that are completely homeless. Is that 16? No, that's no, 13. 13. 13. Fighting yeah. back. Fighting back fighting Santa back. Maria Valley. 13. 13. And they, they already have 20,000. No, they don't. They have 15. Or oh, 15, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Carlos, what were you looking at? Um, so my number... My number one, uh, it's 18. Okay. So, and you can't do 75 by itself. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking that maybe since we have two really good um, number, um, number 10 and number 15, would you consider, would you consider doing number, number 15 with Ms. Soto? And I, I will do my um, com Communify Senior Nutrition with Mr. Cordero. I'll take a minute to, yeah, what? You will? Yeah, no, I, I, I would like to. Uh, oh, take yeah. a minute to yeah, take decide. Yeah, take a minute to, okay. yeah, have an inside conversation. Have an inside <laughs> conversation. I do that all the time. <laughs> He's processing this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question uh, would also be if uh, Ms. Soto would be willing to to also go on the uh, the other way around and support uh, or uh, or farm workers uh, household program. Yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Escobedo, for your question. Um, at this moment in time. Given the need um, and given the fact that we only we have such limited resources for individuals um, living with other abilities um, or disabilities um, and and seeing how um, how the vulnerability within that com particular population um, it just it's really concerning to me that there is there is currently limited support for 
for, for residents um, who, are, who are living with, with disabilities or other abilities. And I think that that was evident with the number of public comments that we got in support of the Independent Living Resource Center. And at this moment in time, from my understanding of people self-help housing, is that they will be able to continue with the, the work mm -hmm. without our $15,000. So that's, um, you know, it, I'm aware that everybody who uh, is not receiving these funds uh, will be able to keep going, right? That was one of the criteria? It is something that's, uh, t that's taken into consideration. However, CDBG funding is ne has never been meant to sustain an agency. It's been meant to augment an agency. So it provides the ability to, for an agency to increase the level of service, not to keep them in business. Does that make sense? So yes, it's taken into consideration, um, but at the same time, um, we also are advised by HUD to also not provide funding to an agency that is not going to be able to sustain themselves if CDBG funding isn't provided. So there's a little bit that's taken into consideration. So they're all going to be able to keep uh, providing this service? They'll, or it's the, pretty as, likely? They'll all be able to provide the service, at what level, I'm not sure, because obviously these dollars augment the amount of service that they're able to provide. Okay. Let me offer you this. If, if you're, you know, if you would like to do the Commify the Senior Nutrition with Mr. Cordero, that would be fine, and then I could do the other part with um, Ms. Soto on the disabilities. or you could add to one that's already getting funded. And, and I actually, I would like to see the, uh, the chapter where it says the person, uh, how much goes to, um, to the different, yeah, that one. And if I may just add that someone who helps care for someone with special needs, this is a really important project for us to fund. Okay. So one of the things I, I see in this the chapter and uh, kind of like the, I think that's, um, there's these priorities and I think that we are destinating a good amount of the criti critical need uh, portion of it. And we get a little bit of, you know, homeless and, and elderly, there's this, uh, it's pretty similar. So, but I don't see a special needs. Um, I, I see that it's the only one that has a, that really target or serve, I would say, uh, that population. So I'll be willing to, um, to move and destinate my Seven thousand five hundred dollars for uh, independent living resources. He's putting his seventy five hundred with ILRC, which is number fifteen. No, I'm going with Mike, and uh, Carlos is going with uh, Gloria. So we will be having two more organizations: the Communify and the Independent Living Resource Center. Communify. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. If it if it pleases the council, I'd like to make a motion for the allocation of the uh, thirty seven thousand five hundred. Madam Mayor is going to 
uh, add her $7,500 to Fighting Back Santa Maria Valley, the Homeless Trad Traditional Youth Services, number 13. Council members uh, Cordero and Waterfield will pull their money together and uh, support Comufine Senior Nutrition, item number 10. And council members Soto and Escobedo will pull their money together for item number 15, Independent Living Resource Center, services and outreach to the individuals with disability. Okay, any further discussion? Are you, have you had enough discussion? <laughs> okay, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Council Member Waterfield. Aye. Council Member Soto. Aye. Council Member Escobedo. Aye. Council Member Cordero. Aye. Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Okay, the next item will be a <clears throat> report by City Manager, Mr. Stilwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The next meeting of the City Council is April 20th, and uh, we have the Opportunity for the council to award the bid for the North Blosser uh, road diet, uh, making that road more pedestrian bike friendly. And we are planning to bring forward a public hearing for the user fees. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Okay. Um, oral reports of council members. Mr. Escobedo, can we start with you? Yes. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to share that last April the 2nd, I attend the grand opening of the Aquista Pache uh, Park. Uh, really nice. I, I, it was a great ceremony and, and the facilities are in, really cool. I actually brought my one of my nieces with me. They were excited about it. They live pretty close by. So when I told them that that was going on, they were Really excited. They went crazy. <laughs> Actually, I I have to. <laughs> when I came back, she didn't want to. She was like, "Carlo, like, say a little bit." So, okay, we'll stay. And so, and and also last, um, it was uh, April first. I was invited to um, to the Migrant Academy Virtual Presentation Day. We did. It was a. It's a group of. Uh, different students from the Santa Maria uh, School District, high school students, and they invite me to be one of the guest speakers and talk a little bit about who I am and where I come from and what we do here at the city at the city council meetings. Good questions and it was a really good experience. So thank you for the invitation, and that's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Waterfield. Madam Mayor, I, I do not have any uh, comments up from my weekly uh, reports, but I do. I did get an email from Sister Janet. She wants she wants to send her greetings and prayers and loving support to everybody here. Thank you, Sister Janet. Thank you, Ms. Soto. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On March seventeenth, I attended the airport district meeting. On March 19th, I attended a planning meeting for the April elected leaders forum on homelessness for the County of Santa Barbara. On March 26th, I met with the mobile, a group of mobile car wash business owners. On April, on March 31st, I met with um, a group at the public defender's office um, that is focused on racial justice. And so they have like a racial justice committee for the public, the Santa Barbara County Public Defender's Office. And on April 1st, I attended um, Migrant Education's annual academy, um, which was a virtual presentation day, which I believe Mr. Escobedo was also a part of. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On the 18th of last month, I had a board meeting associated with the United Way, and uh, we're now having meetings every Monday, uh, getting ready for the Queen contest. Uh, on the 31st, I attended a Zoom meeting for uh, sustainable energy uh, for the Central Coast. Um, and uh, that was uh, interesting, to say the least. 
it's uh, it's an association with the uh, with the power group that we signed up with here. Uh, uh, was that last year or year before that? Uh, on uh, the 29th, I was at uh, the police department for um, some promotional swear-ins, and uh, it, it was kind of nice to know that we were kind of getting back into the groove of things. And uh, it was a pleasure to see a, a couple of people get promoted. Uh, one, Phil Dix, uh, the promoted sergeant there, it, I, I had a little bit to do with his hiring, and, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great asset to the department and, and doing quite well. Um, and then uh, yesterday, um, I attended the, uh, the pinwheel planting thing with you, and, uh, and that has great meaning for me because, uh, as I said earlier, uh, my wife and I have been affiliated with, uh, with the North County Rape Crisis Center for uh, well over 30 years. And um, it was it was it was great. And, and once again, I had that feeling that we're getting back into things. And uh, the North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center was uh, certainly out there to uh, um, to let us know more about their their needs and their accomplishments. And, uh, that would be it for me, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, March 17th, I, uh, I, I, I'm going to say attended the State Council on Developmental, Developmental Disabilities Statewide Adv Self-Advocacy Chats. On the 18th, I did the County Legislative Briefing. On March 24th, I did the California City's homeless, um, Homelessness Roundtable Webinar and did the California City's Mayors and Council Members Roundtable Discussion and Marion Regional Medical Center Healthcare Roundtable with Sue Anderson and Chuck Merrill. On the 25th, I did the American Rescue Plan, which is focused on homelessness, eviction, and poverty webinar. Uh, was a panelist on the Future Business Leaders of America and how, how to be a community leader forum. On March 31st, did the California Channel Counties Division meeting with uh, our Congressman Carbajal. On April 1st, did the Riverside County Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force Steering Committee meeting and also exploring new housing laws and ordinances web webinar and did the Santa Barbara County Legislative Briefing, met with uh, three gentlemen from the Mobile Car Wash. And on April 2nd, did the grand opening of Equest Apache Park, which was absolutely phenomenal. We saved $700,000 by doing that park in-house, and I think we should do it in-house all the time. We have such great talent. Uh, Roy Tenente, um, Rick Garcia, Jose Paz, and Scott Christian. I, I just can't say enough about the park. And yesterday did the pinwheel planning for the child abuse awareness, and this morning did the Ben Hayes show. Any other comments from the dais? You know, if anybody deserves their own park in town to have it named after them, it would certainly be Bobby Equistapash. He was, he was a great guy, and I, I neglected to mention that. I was there for that, too. Yeah, he um, very active in the community, and he was, a, he was a Rotarian with me, but um, Elks Rodeo Parade, Junior a Grand Marshal in 1961, and just very active and giving back to his community all the time. And his wife and family and grandchildren were there to pull back the curtain on the memorial rock for him. So it was very nice, very nicely done. Yes, he was. He, he, he I, I was assigned various responsibilities with the parade over the many years. And there were times when we had to get together, and he would be riding with me, and people would stop us. And um, they would ask him questions about the rodeo. Uh -huh. And, and I, I almost wanted to say this at the other day at the, at the park, but he was so informed that he, would, he had the answers for these people. Uh, they just needed some support, and he was so informed and uh, he 
It was real calm and easy for him. He just, yeah, you just go over there and do this and look in drawer number four and your, your answer's right there. And he was just a, a really uh, a pleasure to, to work with and deal with. Uh, I, I certainly learned a lot from him on how the inner workings of the parade take place. He had a great sense of humor. And it, whoever you were with him at any time, it was there was also there yep. was also humor included in that. Well, I want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, at the dais. We got through a very difficult um, decision-making night, but it was great. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Hey, you, you laughed at me. I'm